fine okay right okay so uh, good afternoon to all i think uh, i'll just uh, read out uh, before our uh, compere speak so that uh, we have our complement of uh, uh, panelists and the speakers and the special guests here uh, we have uh, honorable ajit nimat kabral uh, who's our uh, keynote uh, speaker and the state minister of money and capital market and state enterprise reforms Uh, we have uh, mr zia ul mustafa who is the president of the south asian federation of accountants uh, mr dinesh virakodi chairman international chamber of commerce in sri lanka mr prabhas subasinghe chairman and chief executive sri lanka export development board mr vish govindasamy vice chairman the ceylon chamber of commerce mr Reng s rengaradan managing director chief executive of the commercial bank of ceylon plc dr jushni virakorn executive director institute of policy studies Dr. Nishan Dimel, CEO, Verit Research Private Limited, and Mr. Gavin Nord, the Manager, Business and Investment Policy, CPA Australia. So I will now hand over to our compere, the Dilhani, so that she can start the uh, proceedings. Thank you so much, Professor, and a very good afternoon to all of you, and a very warm welcome. to the National Management Accounting Conference 2020, the annual conference of the Institute of Certified Management Accountants of Sri Lanka, the National Professional Management Accounting Body in Sri Lanka. Owing to the current pandemic situation in the country, CMA will be conducting a virtual conference referred to as a webinar. Nevertheless, CMA, always concerned about your career development and progress in the new normal, has put together a two-day event in keeping with the current COVID-19 pandemic on an interesting line of thought, Business 2030, Global Impact and Value Creation in the Next Normal. With its vision being the preferred choice and working towards its mission to train and develop management accounting professionals who are innovative, socially responsible, knowledgeable, capable of sustainable value creation, and with the high standards of ethics and integrity, CMA was established initially as Society of Certified Management Accountants of Sri Lanka in the year 1999. With the technical assistance of CMA Canada, currently CPA Canada, and financial assistance of the Canadian International Development Agency by its founder, Professor Lakshman R. Watawala, and was officially launched on the 3rd of June in the year 2000. Ten years later, the society was incorporated by an act of parliament in the year 2009 and became the National Professional Management Accounting Institution in Sri Lanka. Thereafter, CMA received the membership of SAFA and the South Asian Federation of Accountants and was followed with the membership of the International Federation of Accountants, the global body for the accounting profession. Continuing its international memberships, CMA obtained the membership of the Confederation of Asian and Pacific Accountants as well. COVID-19 pandemic has affected millions of people throughout the world. Brought economic activity to a near standstill and affected the lives of all sectors of the society. It's not only a health crisis, but has severely impacted the global economic order and popularized online learning, which provided a lifeline for education. The opportunities that digital technologies have provided, new practices of working from home and buying our daily needs online, taking us to a new era in the next economy. The inaugural session of today is on the topic overcoming COVID-19 impact and navigating to the next economy, which will flow into higher and professional education, sustainability and value creation and supply chain management in the new normal. On that note, I deem it a privilege to invite Professor Lakshmanan Watawala, the mastermind behind all endeavors of CMA Sri Lanka, to deliver the welcome address. Professor Lakshman R. Watavala has led the Sri Lankan economy. Yeah, okay. So thank you. I think uh, we are really running short of time. So I thought uh, I will start on the uh, welcome address. Uh, let me welcome our uh, chief guest and keynote speaker, Honorable Ajit Nimat Kabral, who is the State Minister of Money and Capital Market and State Enterprise Reforms. And we also have a very special guest. Uh, with us today is mr ziaul mustafa the president of the south asian federation of accounts i must thank him very much for accepting our invitation and our distinguished and eminent uh, panelists uh, our council members the uh, the other participants uh, let me welcome you to this uh, 
National Management Accounting Conference 2020 of uh, CMA Sri Lanka on Business 2030, Global Impact and Value Creation in the Next Normal. As you all know, today we are really in a different situation and uh, it looks as uh, this is maybe a start of uh, new changes uh, that are going to take place uh, globally as well as in Sri Lanka. So we do hope that all these would be in the best of the interests of the uh, society and the professionals. And uh, the professionals will really be able to take a lead role uh, in this regard. We are also indeed happy that uh, for the first time, uh, a chartered accountant, a management accountant, uh, he is also a fellow member of our institute, Mr. Honorable Ajit Nivad Cabral, uh, going to parliament. I'm sure he will bring a lot of new things uh, uh, and also professionalism in uh, financial management, uh, debt management, and various other areas that are really uh, would be beneficial to the country. So, uh, uh, as you know, the digital technology has really taken us to this new position. And uh, it's not only in uh, seminars, but in all our activities, working from home, then even in the education area, uh, the uh, uh, meetings. Uh, yesterday, I attended a board meeting. So, a lot of the areas, the annual general meeting. So it's uh, really uh, very nice to see everyone attending this uh, e-conference. And I must say that uh, this really is a facility that enables everyone uh, to maybe at their convenience uh, to participate, where you don't have to maybe come running to your workplace, uh, to your uh, hotel or any other place, but it's really a very, very convenient place not only for the participants, but also for our speakers, panelists, and everyone. Well, I know that uh, uh, Honorable uh, uh, Ajit Nivad Kabral is speaking from the parliament. Today, uh, it's a very, very important day for the parliament, but I'm very happy that he's been able to uh, make his time available uh, because uh, they are debating the 20th uh, amendment. And uh, one of the matters which are relevant to the accountants, which I heard, and it was a very important announcement uh, made by the uh, Honorable Minister of uh, Justice, who mentioned that uh, uh, they are going to remove the uh, conditions they had placed on uh, the Auditor General, where the uh, audit of certain of the state-owned organizations were going to be owned companies were going to be taken over and given to private companies. So I think uh, that was really on the public opinion, and they said that they had listened to the public views and done it, which I think is a very good thing and it's in the interest of the profession. And we are very happy that uh, that is there and that we will be able to take it forward. So today we have uh, um, uh, on our conference, four sessions that we have planned, uh, two in the afternoons of uh, today and tomorrow. And uh, they are really on areas. Uh, uh, the first session is on the economy. The second one on reposition in the higher and professional education in the next economy. And the, uh, tomorrow we are discussing on sustainability and long-term value creation. And uh, the final one on the global supply chain, which has really affected some of the major industries that are there. So uh, I think uh, all these topics would be very well handled by our uh, speakers and the panelists. And I do not want to talk too much in that uh, respect, but I just want to give one uh, idea or suggestion that is on the value creation. Today, as you know, in the private sector, if you do not create value, if you do not run your organization profitably, you will be nowhere. But the taxpayers are, what, but in the government institutions, that is not heard of. But I know that uh, the minister here, here, he is in charge of uh, uh, state enterprise reforms. So I, I, I would suggest that he, would, uh, he should really take into account uh, the value creation. We only allocate money in the parliament and uh, they are spent but we should really see that there is value created, not only in the money spent, but also the people who are working in these organizations. Everyone must create value. They must tell what they have done for the benefit of the country. So I do hope that uh, our uh, minister would be able to take this into account. And uh, this is something that is rea really there in our new reporting of integrated reporting. And uh, in the next normal, I think this would be something that we could uh, implement. I'm also uh, indeed uh, honored uh, with the presence of Ziaul Mustafa, the president of SAFA, because 
here again, this was a special invitation extended to him because uh, our honorable uh, minister, uh, Ajit Nimad Kabral, is a past president of the South Asian Federation of Accountants. So uh, the 370,000 professional accountants in our region, I think would be proud of having a, a member in parliament, uh, one of our own members. So that was one main reason that I invited Mr. Zia. And let me thank you uh, for being present for this. And I'm sure that you will be able to speak a few words after I finish on SAFA and the great uh, uh, honor uh, that has been done to, done to us. So with those introductory remarks, I think uh, uh, we really have to take care of time. So I will thank uh, uh, all our uh, keynote speakers, uh, Honorable Minister, the uh, President Safa and our panelists and all our participants that we are in for a very good session, not only one session, but four sessions that all of you all will be able to gain by it and also to take back something not only for yourself, but also to your organizations and make a valuable contribution and to ensure that you create value to your businesses and organizations. Thank you. That, ladies and gentlemen, was Professor Lakshman Arvatawala, President of CMA Sri Lanka. He's the former chairman of the Board of Investment Sri Lanka and People's Bank, and he's currently the deputy chairman of West Ethnicillon PLC, director of Lake House Printers and Publishers PLC and Lanka IOC PLC. Thank you, Professor. Today, we also have with us, and we are happy to have with us, our special guest of honor, the president of SAFA, Mr. Zial Mustafa, who has been invited by Professor Lakshman Arvatawala, a founder signatory to the form of SAFA, the first vice president and later president to recognize and honor another past president of SAFA. Mr. Zia Mustafa, President SAFA, is also the president of ICMA Pakistan for the period 2018 to 20. He's also presently a chairman of the SAFA committee. He's a member of the Policy Board of Auditor General of Pakistan since February 2018. The government of Pakistan has appointed him as a member of the Board of Directors of the Ignite National Technology Fund. We are honored by the presence of the president of SAFA. Mr. Zia Mustafa, and I have pleasure in inviting him to deliver his address. Mr. Zia, you had to Sorry, unmute. Sorry, Mr. Zia. Unmute, please unmute. Sorry. Okay, fine. Thank you, Dilani. Uh, Honorable Ajit Nivad. Cabral, State Minister of Money and Capital Market and State Enterprise Reforms of Sri Lanka. Respectable Professor Lakshman Watawala, Founder President of CMA Sri Lanka. Distinguished panelist of this technical session. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon from Lahore, Pakistan. On behalf of South Asian Federation of Accountants, I would like to appreciate CMA Sri Lanka for organizing this international webinar on overcoming COVID-19 impact and navigating to the next economy. I am feeling honored to be the part of this important event. It is hurting to note that SAFA and its member bodies are proactively creating awareness about the issues created due to COVID-19 and about the way forward. Ladies and gentlemen, as you know, COVID-19 has posed serious threats and challenges to our global and national economies. The economic threat of the pandemic has badly affected the growth rate of global economies, which may even continue in 2021. The business all around the world are dealing with lost revenue and disrupted supply chains and there has been a great instability in the financial markets. And the global financial markets are under significant stress. In such unprecedented and uncertain times, the financial experts, professionals, regulators, as well as professional accounting organizations like CMS Sri Lanka have put their heads together to assess the repercussion of this pandemic on the financial and capital markets. And we have to explore possible mitigating measures for sustainability. For the governments around the world, the health and safety is the top most priority, followed by a financial and non-financial support to disturb industry sector. 
and affected businesses as well. And the employees associated with these businesses are also you know, under consideration, how to help them. At the same time, we also need to restore the confidence of investors in the financial and capital markets. Otherwise, the entire globe economic system would collapse. The modern human mind did not foresee such a calamity and so never thought to devise a mechanism how to deal with it. But now it is a reality and we have to deal with it securely on all fronts. The burning question now is, what is the way forward for the businesses and for the professionals? We have a very good number of professionals, speakers and panelists, and I hope so they will definitely share the way forward and their experiences, how to move now in this COVID environment. I would like to suggest some key steps in this scenario for the professionals and for the business community, that we must have a crisis management plan in every organization. Secondly, how to execute this plan? Virtually, we must have the capability to work virtually. In this situation, we have to design a communication strategy as well, how to communicate because the means of communication are altogether changed. We have to equip ourselves with technology-based resources. Our business houses, corporates, government, educational institutions, professional bodies must have to equip ourselves with technology-based resources. And meanwhile, we must have a contingency plan for various scenarios. And one important thing is we must have reach out strategy, how to reach our clients, customers, so how to you know, communicate and how to reach out. In this scenario, two more things which I would like to share that we have to protect the cash. The cash management is very essential at this moment. So then we have to reprioritize our needs as well. So whether now it is required where we have to go for the capital investments and where we can hold and how to you know, continue the business processes. So we have to reprioritize our needs. So these are the few remarks from my side. And I believe that the learning speaker will you know, discuss all these things in detail. And with these remarks, I am once again thankful to Mr. Lakshman Vadawala, Professor Lakshman Vadawala, the president of CMA Sri Lanka, founding president of CMA Sri Lanka, and the founder of the SAFA platform, South Asian Federation of Accountant, and he has a great contribution for the development of this accountancy and auditing profession, not only in Sri Lanka, but also in the region of SAFA as well as at the international level. And I'm thankful to the team of Sri Lanka for inviting me to speak at this wonderful session. I wish every success to this webinar. Stay blessed, stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Zial. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Zia Mustafa, for your valuable address and representing over 375,000 professional accountants in the South Asian region. We are honored by the presence of Honorable Ajit Iwad Kabral, State Minister of Money and Capital Market and State Enterprise Reforms, as our keynote speaker at the inauguration of the CMA National Management Accounting Conference 2020. Mr. Kabral was the 12th governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka and the chairman of the Monetary Board from July 2006 to January 2015. At that time, he also functioned as an alternate governor of the International Monetary Fund. He is the former chairman of the Southeast Asian Central Bank's Board of Governors and the South Central Bank Governors Forum. He's a chartered accountant by profession, having qualified as one of the youngest chartered accountants in Sri Lanka. He is a past president of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Sri Lanka and the South Asian Federation of Accountants. His book on Towards Sri Lanka Renoid Towards the Sri Lanka Renaissance is a practical work with simple ideas that will change the world, which can especially be put into good use in the current pandemic situation. In the year, in the year 2019, month August, Sri Lanka Ramayana Mahanikaya bestowed the honor of Deshakit Lanka Putra in appreciation of his outstanding contribution to the Sri Lankan economy. 
country and the people of Sri Lanka. Honorable Ajit Niwad Cabral, we are more than happy to have you with us today. Over to you, sir, for the keynote address. You have to unmute, I think. Unmute, yeah. Still, still muted. Right. No, still uh, can't hear. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, fine. Thank you. Yeah, now we can hear you. Now we can hear. Okay. Uh, my friend, uh, Mr. Watawala, and the president of SAFA, Mr. Zia, uh, and other panelists, uh, it's a great honor to be here this afternoon. Uh, I managed to scoot out from the parliament for a few minutes uh, during the debate so that I can uh, relax uh, in a relaxed mode. I can talk to you, all of you and, and uh, I'll probably have to get back as soon as possible. Uh, so thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to share these thoughts with you, which I appreciate very much. And uh, what we would like to do today is to give you a brief outline about how I see the navigation of the economy uh, in this current turbulent times. As you know, this is a turbulence that we hadn't uh, given much thought to in the past. We did have some serious turbulence uh, in the last time that I was at the helm when I was the governor of the central bank. But this time round, it's a fresh turbulence, which we are all uh, beginning to learn to navigate. And I think uh, what I would like to do today in the short time that is available, would be to give you a brief uh, understanding as well as a, a view as to how we could uh, meet with the challenges and what kind of solutions we could have in the different aspects of the economy. So as you know, we could broadly categorize the economy into about five different uh, seg segments. And I will deal with these uh, separately so that it will be easier for us to uh, get to grips with this current situation. Let's take the real economy first, navigating the real economy. Uh, we do find that the greatest impact that we see from a physical side is the impact that the real economy would feel when there is the uh, COVID situation escalating. As you know, there are some instances where we had to close down certain areas. And when you do close down areas, you find that the economic activity in those areas cannot take place. And that naturally poses a fairly serious problem to all those who are in, involved in the economic activity in those areas. At the same time, they also would uh, lead to different downturns, which can then also affect the entirety of the economy. So it's a kind of a real shock for the real economy when there is a lockdown or a closure and that's something that we'll need to be concerned about. And if we can avoid such lockdowns as much as possible and continue with whatever type of um, activities with, of course, health uh, considerations being given the uh, necessary attention, I think that would be very important. So we have found that certain instances, it is possible to do so, as you know. Uh, even during the worst of the COVID-19 period, where which was very, very uncertain, Sri Lanka did open out its agricultural sector and we did have very little work uh, not taking place. Almost every aspect of the work was possible to be done. And the agricultural sector was um, quite uh, effective. And one of the reasons why Sri Lanka has been able to maintain a, one of the highest harvests in recent times is because we were able to continue our activities in the agricultural sector. At the same time, there have been a new norm. That is, lots of people have begun to work from home. 
they've begun to use technology. Today we are having a program which is uh, around 200 odd participants and we are all doing it from the ease of our own homes or offices. So it's a kind of a arrangement that the world has now got used to. And we find that a lot of that work can be actually done without being physically present. And that's uh, an important part. But naturally, of course, certain parts of the work needs to have uh, physical contact as well as physical uh, activities being performed. And in those instances, there can be some interruption. But as much as possible, we are now getting used to this new normal where people are able to work from their own environments without having to physically be present at certain locations in order to carry out certain functions. So it's an interesting phenomenon. It has got quite uh, uh, accelerated as a result of the pandemic. And I believe that's one of the, in a way, a good things, one of the good things that has happened in this uh, recent past where we are able to maneuver ourselves in these activities. But of course, activities such as construction, activities such as the um, tourism industry, which all need physical presence as well as physical services being performed are interrupted. And that's a great pity because those areas can sometimes be a dampener in the overall growth story of a country and of an economy. So, Whilst we would have those kinds of interruptions, as long as we can have port activities, customs, banking sector, insurance services functioning, the real economy may not be as affected as it would have otherwise been. And that's important for us to now get used to uh, managing our businesses from a remote facility as well. The stock exchange seems to be performing well, by, al although they are some distance away, and these are all good signs where we have been able to now migrate to better systems. The auctions are, are another example. So in that sense, we have had some successes, which I believe is uh, encouraging us to go for, forward in the future. The other, other area that I think uh, we need to carefully navigate is our monetary sector. As you know, uh, we would also need to have um, special instruments being put in place in order to ensure that the downturn of the economy to some extent is managed. Uh, we would need to have uh, uh, our monetary sector being carefully planned as well as uh, managed so that we would be able to have uh, reasonable interest rates, notwithstanding the fact that certain uh, situations have arisen within the economy. So that's an important aspect of the navigation. We have uh, had to grapple with that. We have had to see that there is uh, sufficient uh, money being pumped into the economy in order to ensure that economic activities are not hindered. We've got to ensure that uh, the auctions of uh, various uh, products as well as uh, monetary services are also continued. So those whilst posing challenges uh, would necessarily be areas that we would have to further improve. And the recent uh, uh, initiatives by the central bank were useful in the sense that they have now been able to have uh, manage their businesses as well as continue with their activities. So these are all uh, avenues that we can embrace as the new normal. And hopefully we would be in a position to uh, move towards these new instruments in order to ensure that the monetary sector could be planned and executed without undue complications being felt within the economy. The fiscal sector is also very challenging and the navigation through the fiscal side is actually going to be quite challenging, particularly because if the overall real economy is to suffer, the immediate impact would be in the form of taxation, which can reduce. Fortunately, the last three months uh, in Sri Lanka, it has been, uh, although somewhat roller coaster ride, we have had some good uh, recoveries, uh, which has helped us a great deal. And that's something that uh, we need to be closely uh, watching. At the same time, in that sector also, we got to ensure that our interest rates remain uh, at uh, reasonable levels so that we don't have to uh, really uh, worry with a higher burden on the, uh, on the uh, uh, budget. 
and those will be areas that the new normal uh, would need to address in order to ensure that there is no leakage as far as the overall uh, fiscal side is concerned. Collecting taxes is going to be quite a challenge, so we need to have uh, solutions for that. And I believe with the um, new automation uh, would also help. So automation of customs, of excise, of uh, the government uh, revenue sources could be very helpful. And that's another area that we would need to see uh, gradual improvement as well as uh, focus so that we can still continue with our activities without an undue uh, reduction in the revenues as well. The fourth area that I would like to quickly touch upon is the external sector, which is one of the heavily uh, dependent on outside world. And when we have less contact or we find uh, remittances coming in, uh, in, in having, having, having a challenge uh, can definitely be a problem. Fortunately, uh, that has not been affected as much as we originally expected, and that has been a uh, uh, very welcome sign. But at the same time, the savings of the, uh, of the oil bill being reduced has somewhat been uh, negated by the tourism receipts being almost zero. But the fact that Sri Lankans have not been able to go out and they have been traveling within has also helped the overall external sector to some extent. In addition, of course, uh, we will see that uh, people will find it uh, challenging since they, in their own countries, they're having difficulties of their own accounts uh, to come in and uh, invest outside. So that's going to be a fairly uh, tough challenge to, uh, con to consider. But these will all be matters that we'll have to uh, be keeping a close tab on in order to ensure that the rupee stays uh, at attractive levels and that uh, it's not going to be uh, uh, unduly depreciated. And the flows from outside are also continuing. So th that's, that will be one of the key challenges that all economic planners and managers would have to face. And I think it's not something that only Sri Lanka would uh, have to uh, uh, worry about. It's a challenge which is global and all countries we will now need to look at these challenges with a, with a greater uh, focus because those can actually be quite serious unless there are solutions being found for all these areas. Uh, I have always been saying that global problems need global solutions. And I still want to uh, continue with the engagements to ensure that the global bodies, which are responsible for the, uh, for the uh, world economy, as well as the global uh, health of uh, countries are uh, maintained, are actually going to do their job in a more robust manner. So that's something that we would want to continue to ask people to do, because that's important so that we can have a better uh, situation worldwide. The last point that I would like to make today is that of the financial system. When in times of these kinds of crisis, the entire financial system will be under some element of challenge and threat. So we need to find new solutions to ensure that the financial system stays stable and that stays sound. And that's one of the other key challenges that all economies will face. Uh, we have seen in many jurisdictions, the overall non-performing non levels of loans have risen. We find that collection is a lot more challenging because some of the businesses are facing various uh, problems of their own. And that's another area that we would need to keep a close tab on uh, in order to ensure that Sri Lanka, uh, like most of the other countries, are up to the mark in dealing with this situation. It's a challenging situation. Uh, we would find that in the short term, there can be somewhat uh, difficult choices to make. Uh, sometimes moratoriums had to be given in order to ensure that there is certain space being provided for these uh, borrowers to be able to sustain themselves. And whilst doing that, there is always the automatic situation on the other side where there is a weak weakening of the financial institutions. So right balance needs to be struck in all these things. So new instruments need to be done. And the new normal uh, has been also established by many central banks in the world where they have been a lot less uh, worried in um, 
increasing their holdings of treasury bills in their respective governments. That has been uh, examined from different areas and different quarters. But these are all uh, part of a new normal that we are now getting adjusted to and, uh, and uh, having to deal with. So I would think that in time to come, when things become more normal, uh, we would be able to uh, again get back into a new equilibrium. But right now, uh, there is a certain element of um, challenge as well as certain element of experimentation that is needed because there is no real right answer at this current moment. There is nothing uh, that you can borrow from a textbook or get from a particular uh, professor who can, uh, who can tell you this is what happened in this particular uh, situation. So there would be a bit of experimentation, a bit of intuition, a bit of uh, 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 theory, a bit of practical sense, all being applied together so that a new equilibrium could be honest and uh, put in place. So, Mr. Watamala, I want to congratulate you for uh, arranging a seminar of this nature, although it is virtual. Uh, I think it's uh, very important uh, uh, for people to discuss these matters and come up with solutions. I also want to say thank you to Mr. Zia for the for the contribution that you are making through SAFA, because I think the accountants of the world, all 375,000 of them, well, the time that I was the president of SAFA, I think it was much less than that. Uh, and that was a long time ago, I can tell you. But I think uh, now with your current uh, resources that you have, I'm sure you can get to grips with the situation, give you ideas and contribute in such a way that we can all learn from each other and move forward with a lot more confidence. So thank you very much for inviting me. I um, am very grateful to you for this topic and as well as your deliberations. And I look forward to staying in touch with all of you in order to uh, take uh, our country forward and perhaps the uh, South Asian region, uh, which is also a very populous region so that we can all have solutions which will work for our region as well as for the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Minister, Thank I think you, sir. Uh, for very, very uh, yeah, useful and also the introduction uh, uh, with, for this uh, commencement of our conference, a keynote address, the very important areas of uh, the money side, the fiscal side, and uh, the other important areas relating to the accounting profession, which uh, you outlined. Uh, Minister, uh, I think uh, I, we have our moderator, Mr. Dinesh Virakudi. Would it be possible to take one or two questions? Yes, I could do a couple of questions and then uh, I might need to uh, yeah, uh, yeah. run away. I don't want uh, yeah. to be out for too long. Yeah. We, we'll do it fast. So, can I invite yeah. you to uh, maybe yeah. start with uh, the introduction? Maybe. Yeah, okay. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Minister. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, very much. Very, very yeah. much. I, I won't ask anything about the 20th Amendment, so, uh, but this will be only more I, I, I have no point <laughs> in that. You can do that if you like. <laughs> uh, my question to you, there are two questions that I got on, uh, on uh, SMS that I thought I'll put to you. The first question is, with the current COVID-19 situation in the country, what additional aspects would, would be taken into consideration and what are the areas of the economy which will be prioritized when preparing the 2021 budget. Thank you, Dinesh. The first part, the first reaction that I would like to share with you is that we are a lot more prepared for the fallout than when the pandemic first struck in February, March, 2020. People know how to manage the, the, um, the illness better. They know how to deal with the, uh, the fallout. And from an economic point of view, we are also a lot more prepared in dealing with the situation. So many institutions, many organizations have prepared themselves to face up to a situation of this nature. And therefore, I think the impact of that would be definitely less than the initial impact that we had to undergo. The second part of it is uh, we have had to have a fairly large fiscal deficit in the year 2020, mainly because two reasons. One is the... Uh, dealing with COVID, which is quite a, a new area that we had to work on. And the second was that we needed to stimulate the economy after a fairly uh, uh, reduction, after a fair reduction in the growth uh, situation. 
So I think about 4% of GDP had to be uh, used to stimulate the economy, both by way of uh, dealing with the COVID outcome and the, out and the fallout, as well as the stimulation of the economy. So both those uh, won't be there for the next year. So which will be uh, hopefully uh, a big saving. And the fact that interest rates have also come down quite uh, significantly would mean that there will be some significant savings that we would enjoy. So the budget of 2021 would definitely be uh, one which, where we would like to get back into a growth level as fast as possible, for which we will need investment. But there we would like to concentrate a lot more on the investment that is going to come from the private sector as well as from uh, different quarters of various projects that we are going to put in place. So particularly the port city and the Hambantota port, as well as in the education sector, in the, uh, in the IT sector. Uh, and um, now I can see uh, Prabash uh, here. So I'm sure there will be also uh, various thoughts that would be prepared by them in order to encourage the exports. Uh, we are trying to see whether we can find different uh, products being manufactured or different services being done out of Sri Lanka, for which we had to pay from a, pay foreign currency in the past. So these are uh, shifts in our economic activities, which I think would hold us in good stead. And uh, I'm confident that uh, even with the COVID, we would now learn to have a new normal as what you have been suggesting. And uh, through that, uh, we would probably be able to face up to these challenges a lot better than we first uh, encountered the pandemic. Yeah, just two quick questions before we let you go. The next question is in terms of expectations from the private sector. What are your thoughts, sir? I think the private sector naturally will have expectations of stability as well as uh, having uh, clarity as far as the part of the policies are concerned. And that's one of the uh, key uh, ingredients that as a government, we are in a position to now offer. As you know, we have a government which is stable. We have a two thirds majority. And uh, th those are indications that we would be in a position to have various uh, uh, matters being handled without too much of a, uh, too much of a uh, worry. At the same time, if you look at my own portfolio, which is uh, state sector reforms, state enterprises reforms, uh, I'm taking that part very seriously. That as well as the project management part, uh, as you know, there are about um, 800 projects currently being uh, continued by the government and about 300 of those are more than a billion rupees each. So those need to be, uh, so that there are, if there are any interruptions, those need to be addressed. And we're taking that part very seriously while also looking at the major institutions. There are about 300 of those to see how best we can improve the services as well as their own deliveries. So uh, we would expect those to be a trigger for the private sector also to get activated. And we are looking at the private sector with a lot of hope and with a lot of, uh, uh, with a lot of uh, trust so that they also would, uh, would come up to the occasion and then have their activities. They have got a, they, they, they can look forward, they can expect uh, a rupee which would be stable. They could expect uh, reasonable and low interest rates they could expect uh, the government uh, trying its best to ensure that the doing business indicators are improved. They could expect the government services to become a lot more efficient in the next few months and years. So we would like to deliver those, particularly with, with in addition to that, the infrastructure developments as well. So with that, we are hoping that the stage will be set for the private sector to do better. And we would like to see them coming up and doing that in order to deliver better results than what we had in the past. Right. Uh, my final question is your, your ma magic has helped the stock market so far. Uh, what are your plans going forward? I want to learn a few more new magic tricks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, actually, we have to get our basics right, uh, Dinesh. I think that's important. The main building blocks of the economy, that's why I mentioned those five main building blocks at my uh, inaugural uh, speech uh, because i think those are very important to get right to get the basics right then our building blocks right i think then we'll be able to build on that because that foundation is on which the private sector will also have their expectations if they feel that these 
uh, are going to be stable and we are politically stable and that we can um, deliver on what we have stated, I think they will react in a much more positive manner. So the magic, as you mentioned, is mainly because of the positive uh, feelings that they have been able to uh, have in their own minds. And I think in the overall economy also, we need to perform and show that uh, these, are, uh, the, these are the new trends that we have put in place. So the first few change in the trend is the difficult part. Always uh, that, that, that turnaround is a difficult part. And we know that, and we we'll concentrate on working to make that turnaround. And once that does happen, we would see the uh, in the rest of the economy also uh, some magic uh, working. Thank you. David. And you're optimistic about foreign funds coming in hopefully in 2021. Yes, we have. Yeah. We have already had a lot of uh, bilateral discussions. We are having some new instruments that we are working on. Uh, there would be some. Um, new areas which uh, we haven't thought through yet uh, coming into the picture. Uh, those will be exciting. Uh, I'm uh, personally excited about that as well because these are going to be new avenues in which uh, Sri Lanka could do very well. So uh, we are working on those diligently and I think the results of that would be seen, uh, I think before the, before the new year and uh, we would be able to then approach the new year with a lot more confidence and then and go forward. So uh, stay tuned, uh, Dinesh. Uh, we would like to have the participation of um, all of you and your active participation in all these new ventures. And I'm sure the private sector also will have great opportunities to work together and in partnership. And we are looking forward to that uh, contribution to come in the next few months and years. Thank you. Good luck with the debate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Yeah. Uh, Honorable Ajit Nivat Cabral. We are indeed uh, grateful because you laid the foundation for our conference. I'm sure our panelists will have a lot more comments uh, to make on what uh, you have stated and also their own suggestions as to how that we can uh, take the economy to a new level in this uh, next uh, economy. So once again, let me uh, thank you. Uh, and also we are very proud that uh, uh, not only the South Asian uh, Federation of Accountants, but all our accountants here, both the chartered accountants, the, the management accountants, and the accounting technicians, and also the organization of professional associations, which you have been closely associated and also been connected with us. And uh, we wish you uh, all the best, and I'm sure that uh, you will be able to really make a, a very big contribution uh, to the uh, uh, Sri Lankan government and the economic development of Sri Lanka. Thank you very much and we wish you all the best. Thank you, Lakshman, and I wish all of you a very successful uh, seminar. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Uh, Dilhani, you Thank can... Thank you, sir. That was Honorable Ajit Nivad Abral, the State Minister of Money and Capital Markets and State Enterprise Reforms. Next in agenda is a panel discussion moderated by Mr. Dinesh Virakodi, Chairman, International Chamber of Commerce in Sri Lanka, and the Chairman of the Hat National Bank, PLC. We also have as panelists with us today, Mr. Prabash Subhasingha, Chairman and Chief Executive of the Sri Lanka Export Development Board, Mr. Vish Govindasamy, Vice Chairman of the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce, Mr. S. Ranganathan, Managing Director, Chief Executive Officer of the Commercial Bank of Ceylon, PLC, Dr. Dushne Virakun, Executive Director, Institute of Policy Studies, Dr. Nishan Dimel, CEO of Variety Research Private Limited, and Mr. Governor, Manager, Business and Investment Policy, CPA Australia. May I also remind participants to send up questions via the chat or the Q&A to be answered by our panelists. Over to you, Mr. Dinesh. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon to all the panelists. Before we start our conversation, can we have that uh, video clip, please? The IMF's International Monetary and Financial Committee says it will use all the tools at its disposal to restore jobs, confidence and growth around the world. It also said making COVID-19 vaccines and treatments available to all countries is the key to overcoming the pandemic and, by extension, helping economies to recover. 
The IMF published its latest World Economic Outlook earlier this week, forecasting the global economy will contract by 4.4% in 2020. It was a slightly improved forecast compared to its last one in June, but the IMF's managing director called on governments not to lose their nerve as the crisis drags on. Stepping up vital health measures is an imperative, as is well-targeted fiscal and monetary support to households and to firms. So the IMF uh, message from these meetings is very clear. Avoid premature withdrawal of support. Pulling the plug too soon risks serious self-inflicted harm. The IMF says China will be the only major economy in the world to achieve growth this year. Its economists also found that advanced economies are coping with the global recession triggered by COVID-19 better than developing ones. There's some relief for those countries in the short term, with the G20 nations this week extending debt relief on $14 billion of payments for another six months. But the IMF says the coronavirus pandemic could still lead to higher levels of poverty and inequality across the world. Giles Gibson for CGTN in Washington. The IMF's inter uh, Thank you. Uh, uh, Dushni, can you hear me? Yes, I can, Dinesh. Yeah, I'd like to start with you and I'll, like, I'll keep the questions short in the interest of time. Uh, uh, if this pandemic hangs on for another year, what is, your pro uh, what is your prognosis for the global economy and for South Asia? I, I, I used to mention South Asia instead of Sri Lanka. Okay. Uh, I think, I mean, in some sense, we are getting a lot of bad news, but in, 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 in all of it, there are glimmers of hope. If you look at the forecast now, not only for global GDP growth, um, there is a slight revised improvement to it. If you look at the forecast for world um, trade for 2020, the initial estimate in uh, April was that we would see a contraction of over 30%. And now the WTO has revised that to um, 10%. So um, in some sense, better than expected performance, uh, international financial markets are also doing reasonably well. As the minister said, stock markets are recovering around the world. Some are even doing better than um, COVID, uh, pre-COVID uh, levels, and these are mirrored in Sri Lanka as well. So I think um, it, my sense also is to sort of um, uh, say, re-emphasize what the minister said, that we have learned lessons. When the COVID-19 hit, um, countries were unprepared, this virus was not known, shutdowns happened without any warning. So I would imagine that continuing into another year, it will be a drag on the um, uh, global economy for sure. And then for countries like ours that are struggling with um, fiscal pressures and all the rest of it. Um, but I am not that um, uh, negative in, in, in the sense that I think lessons have been learned and um, there is some convergence uh, in terms of the necessity to keep um, stimulus measures um, being rolled out. Uh, and uh, in that sense that we might see a better recovery than we did during the uh, 2008 global financial crisis. Okay. In terms of protecting lives versus protecting the economy, what are some of the trade-offs that we need to take? Well, I, I, I don't believe in that uh, trade-off. I know it's being very widely discussed, but I think for any country or any government, the priority is protecting lives. Um, the trade-off is that if you uh, impose lockdown measures, the economic cost, short-term economic cost is much more severe um, as opposed to uh, more sort of uh, relaxed measures uh, where the longer term cost could be much higher. So in, in that sense, I, I think even for us at this stage, when we are seeing a, a, another cluster uh, of infections emerging, the uh, priority should remain at the health um, front, putting all possible fiscal resources to support that um, health intervention. And let's take care of the economy as a, as a um, secondary uh, uh, factor. Okay, thank you. Uh... Uh, can, Wish, can you hear me? Wish?
Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. I can hear you. Yeah. Uh, Vishal, move on to you. Uh, you are a big private sector guy. You are chairman of the EFC, vice chairman of the, uh, the, the Ceylon Chamber. In terms of government policy, are you satisfied with some of the interventions made in the, in the recent past? And what more do you need from the government in case this uh, pandemic hangs on for another 12 months? So initial reactions on uh, the government's involvement from uh, February, March, I think it was a complete unknown so it was more a reaction than anything else. Uh, but uh, I think going forward, uh, in my opinion, there'll be three issues that the government needs to uh, concentrate. That is trade, cost, and technology. So cost is going to be a big issue. And as you know, we are not lavish with cash. So we need to find out ways how to manage our costs. Uh, in terms of technology, I wouldn't say Sri Lanka compared to all the neighboring countries, we are not super technologically advanced. So that is something that we government needs to really uh, put money behind. I know since March, they have done a, quite a bit where now we can do a lot more things online, et cetera, than before. But that's just uh, touching the surface. If we want our economy to improve, there has to be serious, serious money put in technology. Uh, the last, it's a so point for me, uh, trade. We are a country of traders, right? We have traded all our lives since uh, we have known this country. By just blocking trade, and I know the EDB chairman is here, and he is going to expect everybody to push out goods from here, but the door to import is shut. Uh, it can't be one way, you know, it, it, trade has to happen both ways. I understand the, the, the reason that we have shut our doors for imports, but it has to be in a controlled fashion. It can't be just one way street. Uh, eventually, there will be countries that says, you know what, you don't want my goods, why am I taking your goods uh, if, if it's not already happened? So uh, that thing, I think the government needs to uh, take care of a little bit better than uh, it is there right now. Dinesh. Okay. Uh, in terms of protecting jobs and stuff like that, uh, Vish, is the private sector doing enough? I think the private sector, uh, given the issues that has had, uh, has come out a, a lot stronger than uh, it is known. Uh, remember, we don't have labor laws in this country that we can easily hire and fire. Uh, so we are stuck under the current labor laws, and we are still, you know, keeping our entire labor force. Most uh, uh, private sector is, uh, you know, uh, is not let go the force, uh, labor force that it doesn't need now. It is still carrying that labor force as much as they can. So uh, I think it's a commendable job, in my opinion, what the private sector has done in keeping the labor force busy. Okay, Vish, uh, you raised a very important, important point about technology. Uh, in the last six months, have you seen Sri Lankan companies really adapting some of these uh, technologies to drive down costs? Uh, that's what I said. Uh, we need to do a lot, a lot more. Uh, I think we are still, you know, the, the last two months uh, from Say July to August, I saw the tendency to quickly go back to where we were because things were, everything was okay. People didn't want to adapt to the new norm. Uh, it's always about going back to where we were. I think uh, Sri Lankan private sector and the government now needs to let go of where we were. We need to uh, and, and, and understand this is how the future is going to go and then put money behind uh, where we are now. And if not for this pandemic, Dinesh, yeah. next 12 months, who knows? We may have another something. You know, it, it, this is how it's going to evolve the future. So technology is something that we need to adapt very, very fast. And we need to put money behind that. As much as even in the health side, if you look at, uh, I know Dr. Dushni said, we need to look after our people. Uh, technology, there as well. We need to put money in technology in looking after our people. Uh, most countries have uh, magnificent methods of tracing. Uh, I don't think we, we don't even act in this country of tracing the COVID patients here, even after seven months of COVID. And we don't need to reinvent the wheel. People have already done this. Why not adapt it? Okay. There, this one final question before I move on to Prabash. 
uh, uh, I read in a newspaper today that one of the ambassadors saying that the chambers are not doing enough to get uh, to look for new markets for their members. Uh, any thoughts around that? Um, <laughs> anybody can say anything they want. Uh, why wouldn't the businessman look for new markets? I mean, you know, think about it. We are in the business of selling. We are in the business of buying. That's why I said trade should be open. Um, I think the embassies around the world has always uh, known to be a, a government firm looking after the political affairs, etc. I think they need to change to become more business friendly. The commercial attaches need to be from the commercial department and, you know, opening doors for the private sector. So I think uh, hopefully this government will be able to look at that uh, more in a better fashion and do that. Uh, thank you, Vish. Uh, I, uh, Prabhas, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So, Vish, set the stage for you. Uh, <laughs> I can ask this question very easily. This uh, exports, to, uh, to be fair by you, exports have done quite well in the last three months. Uh, I think there's been over a billion a month. Uh, what are some of the changes you have done to the mix? And also, what are some of the new, uh, new markets that you are looking at uh, at the moment? So, to answer your first question, I think... Um, the export sector has done tremendously well. I think the private sector has been very resilient in the way they manage the crisis. I also think it's been helpful for us that global trade has come to almost a 90% level at pre-pandemic levels. And I think the government's job is to create an enabling environment for businesses to operate. And I think that's where we've been efficient in being able to support businesses to operate. And that's a reason for this incredible performance. I would be concerned about what's happening right now. I think Sri Lanka has lived in a bubble since April till two weeks ago. A bubble has crashed now, whereas the rest of the world has moved forward. So I think it's important for our businesses to think about surviving in this current context and to manage their businesses, even with COVID, uh, with the COVID episode like what's happening right now. Yeah, yeah. in terms of the mix uh, and also new markets, in terms of mix, we've really concentrated basically on what was really needed, especially on the PP, et cetera. We don't see a lot of steam for the PP going forward. I think that ship has already sailed. I've always been a proponent saying we need to change our basket, but you can't change your export basket overnight. We've had a historical export basket for almost 30 years. So it's actually the private sector and the business leadership that needs to look at pivoting into new areas. We've identified certain areas, and I think we've seen an incredible opportunity in sectors like agriculture, sectors in terms of food, food and beverage. So I think those opportunities, Sri Lanka being an ag economy, is something we can capitalize on. And I think that's an opportunity for our businesses. I've always said two things. One is we need to pivot in terms of our export basket. We also need to pivot in terms of our markets. We're historically dependent on the US and the European Union. I think we need access to Asia. We need better access, certainly, than what we have. Um, and that needs to happen through free trade agreements. So that's a longer conversation, but it's something we are working on. There's no question. For us to grow, we definitely need to access the Asian market without having any high taxes for our products. OK. Uh, Prabash also wish uh, 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 actually talked about the role of our embassies. Uh, are you happy with the role they are playing currently? And what are the changes you'd like to see? Honestly, we've been working. A loaded question. Um, not, not a problem. <laughs> Being in this job now, I'm used to loaded questions. <laughs> I, I think we've been working with the foreign ministry uh, since I took office, and we've had a very close relationship. We actually have weekly meetings with the foreign ministry in terms of how they can do better. I think there's an incredible amount of talent. Maybe I would agree that we need more technical proficiency. We need people who can speak the local language. We need people who can understand the business. But at a high level, when we talk about the ambassadors that are out there, we talk about the trade commissioners that are out there, I think they're exceptional. I think what the missing link has been historically is to put this into a certain level of order. So we worked with some of the key missions over the last so many months, and we work, our, our plan is let's work on some targeted products for specifically targeted markets without just trying to sell everything everywhere. For us, we see that to be successful. I think the EDB has organized more than 25 B2B meetings with various countries. So yes, I think 
everybody needs to improve in what they do. But I, so far, I would say that I've been very happy with what they've done and they really supported the export community. Uh, thank you, Prabash. Just one more question before I move on to Renga. Uh, you are an exporter in your own right. You're a big exporter in your own right. In terms of value chains and all that, what more can Sri Lankan companies do to plug into some of those uh, value chains? I think it's, it's, um, it's an uncut diamond. I think we are missing a golden opportunity by not, um, not capitalizing on the supply chain diversification. Export that, and somebody's got to pay an income, uh, import duty for it when it comes to their country. So we need to look at selectively first organizing at least some strategic interest with certain countries, and then number two, maximizing the opportunity that's out there in terms of capitalizing on these global value chains. So pharma is something we've been as a government working on. We're looking at setting up a pharmaceutical zone in Sri Lanka, which is something completely new in terms of export, building a billion dollar export. And I think it's a prime opportunity for Sri Lanka. Again, as far as a government, a government can only create an enabling environment. It's up to the businesses to create joint ventures, build partnerships, and also invest in new areas to capture those opportunities that are available. Uh, thank you, Prabash. Uh, Renga, can you hear me? Yes, Desh, uh, can hear you. Yeah, okay. uh, Renga, you have, uh, you have mentioned that banks uh, the bank should change their lending approach on several fronts and pass out some of the benefits of the transformation to the customer, right? Uh, uh, where, where are we on that? Uh, well, uh, I feel with this uh, pandemic, uh, uh, from the time that the pandemic started, I think banks have been working very well in regard to servicing the customers through by providing the financial services. But the bank's lending approach, now as we go on, the bank's lending approach needs to change from the traditional models, focusing on the past track records, and uh, now to you know, compute their repayment capacity, they cannot continue to have these past records as a basis. So high attention should be paid to the factors such as the integrity of the customer, realistic business cash flows projections, and also on the sustainability of their business model. Banks need to build you know, resources to look at the customer's different types of scenarios in which they are operational and uh, come up with realistic approach to them. So I think the lending should totally change from those days. We know we look at the past track record, you know, last six months, account order, turnovers, et cetera. Now I think we need to move out from that and see from now onwards what, what, how the business model is planned by the entrepreneur and how they are trying to take forward in the future is the way that we should take forward our lending approach. Yeah. Uh, yesterday, we were having a conversation about what the new economy would look like. What would banks look like in the new economy? Well, banks will move, move into the digital platform. So the brick and mortar will have to be brought down uh, because the banks are spending nearly 50% of our operational cost is on the staff and the balance 50% is on the infrastructure related costs. So I think this uh, staff need to be realigned and you know given different types of uh, assignment. And I think from the good old days, the way that we worked at the counters need to be changed. So I think uh, by this time, most of the banks in this country has moved into the digital platforms and the value of the digital investments are being derived. So over a period of time, now the next to four to five years time, I think we'll see more automated banking centers, electronic uh, kiosks, uh, around the country rather than more branch network with more staff numbers. Okay. Uh, uh, Renga, how are the, how are the unions uh, looking at this? I think because that is one of the biggest challenge for banks. unions. Unions, I, in my experience, I think as long as we explain the basis of our decision and the logic behind that and uh, work with them, I think unions will definitely accept that. Now, we are not talking about reducing the number of staff. We are talking about realigning the functions of our staff members and making use of them in a more effective manner and uh, freeing them from some of the stress that they have in preparing the returns and various other work to more of a customer-related uh, transitions. 
So I think I'm sure that unions will also will fall in line with the management thinking. Okay. Uh, one uh, one final question before I move on to uh, move on to Nishan. Uh, CMA has been doing a lot of work around this uh, SMEs, uh, trying to give them a lifeline. Uh, I know Commercial Bank does a lot of work with the uh, with the SMEs. Talk us through how you all help some of the SMEs during this crisis. And yeah, especially this crisis uh, hangs on for another 12 months. Yeah. What more can we do? During this to? crisis, Dinesh, even otherwise, yeah. we have been creating a culture within the bank to have more passion towards this particular SME uh, entrepreneurship. Because uh, that has been, uh, you know, over a period of time, we have been building up that culture. And I'm happy that uh, even during the pandemic, that uh, particular passion or the culture that we have developed has helped us. What we did even during the height of the pandemic when we were on lockdown, we got in touch with almost all the branch managers through these virtual platforms and explained to them that they should really get in touch with their borrowers and find out in what position they are and try to see how best that the bank could help them to come out of their problems. Initially, we all know that the government also came up with a two months working capital facilities. But even at that time, we know that the location by the government is going to be limited to all the banks. Then they said initially 150 billion, and then finally they said 50 billion allocation. So we knew that it's going to be a tough time for us to manage that 50 billion. Still, we con contacted all the branch network and told them that please get in touch with the customers, explain the scheme, and try to find out what exactly the requirements. As you know, it has been now published. We got 20 billion requests from our branch network. So within when we got 20 billion, we thought, okay, it's not possible for us to get that 20 billion funded from the government allocation of 50 billion. So immediately we reached out to external overseas uh, development financial institutions, and we tried our best to see how best that we can secure some overseas funding to meet these custom requirements. That's how we were successful in getting uh, IFC's uh, COVID uh, emergency fund of $50 million during the month of May. So that way, I think overall, as long as we have the passion to assist the SME and we really have a very close dialogue with these customers, we should be able to succeed in uh, supporting this SME sector. Uh, Renga, there's a specific question for you about how the interest rates will behave in the next six months. Somebody is complaining that deposit rates are too low. I, 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 you know, interest rate is not a question that any banker can easily answer. But with my experience, I will easily answer this question because the question is about six months period. I think I'm sure the interest rate will remain low as it is at this moment of time. It will never go up. It may go down slightly, but it will, in my view, I think it will not go up in the next six months time. Right. Thank you, Regla. Uh, Nishan, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, Nishan, this is not my question. Uh, so I, uh, so uh, don't take it as a miss. Right. Uh, the question reads: Before the crisis, Sri Lanka was already struggling to manage to manage its debt. Full stop. Given the current climate and the and the recent credit rating downgrade by Moody's, what action should the government take to manage debt in the future? Uh, and uh, it's, it goes on to say: We need long-term solutions. We can't keep rolling over debt. Thank you, Dinesh, and let me thank Professor Watavala as well. Uh, for organizing this event uh, and, the, and the person that sent in that question uh, because I think it is definitely a very pertinent question for Sri Lanka at this time. Perhaps the best way to answer that is uh, to frame it within the question of debt sustainability. Uh, so is Sri Lanka's debt sustainable? Uh, I think when you are the cost uh, you know when debt is sustainable you have to make sure that the cost of interest or the repayment of debt is not what is driving debt upwards so the moment the cost of interest or the uh, of servicing the debt is driving uh, increased debt at some point that becomes unsustainable uh, and also you have to ask that the people are willing to lend to you because of course people, if, if you can't roll over debt, then your debt becomes unsustainable as well. There are typically two ratios uh, that we look at in, in understanding debt sustainability. Uh, the first is debt to GDP, 
uh, and second, um, and this is talked about less, the cost of interest uh, as a ratio of government revenue, okay? Uh, because that is really, if you can have a large debt stock and some countries do, uh, but the cost of interest to government revenue is low, therefore you can maintain that stock of debt and keep servicing it uh, without doing being too difficult. Uh, now, interestingly, Sri Lanka is coming to critical points on both these ratios. Uh, for instance, uh, Sri Lanka is reaching what I would say is an inflection point in the debt to GDP ratio. We are going, at the end of the year, we should be around 100% in terms of debt to GDP. Now, that's considered an inflection point. That was seen uh, red as a point of vulnerability for many economies. So I think we have to worry about that. Uh, but just on the, on, the, on the positive side, I would say that, you know, it's not unprecedented. Sri Lanka has been at, a, at over 100% debt to GDP before. Uh, that was in 2003, uh, when the debt to GDP ratio was 105%. Uh, and it was effectively managed downwards, uh, all the way down to about uh, 70% uh, in 2013. So the fact that uh, that first ratio is at an inflection point itself doesn't mean the debt is unsustainable. I think the difference from the past may be in the second ratio, uh, where in 2003, Sri Lanka had a debt uh, revenue to interest ratio of 45%. Uh, in 2020, this year, we expect that to be about 60% in terms of uh, interest uh, as a proportion of government revenue. So I think that puts Sri Lanka in, a, in, in some difficulty with regard to servicing its debt uh, going forward uh, if you don't negotiate that down. And the reasons are basically that in 2003, 98% of foreign loans were concessional. In 2019, only 43% of foreign loans are concessional. Uh, the amount, ratio of foreign loans to local have remained uh, about the same at 45%. And current, just, to, just to talk about the current dynamics, uh, I think, Dinesh, that the international sovereign bonds, the interest rate that Sri Lanka faces on inter international sovereign bonds have doubled. Uh, now, on the positive side, uh, I think the government has successfully brought down the cost of borrowing on local debt. Uh, so local debt cost of borrowing has halved this year, uh, whereas sovereign bonds have doubled. But the doubling of the interest rate on the sovereign bonds means effectively they're over 10%. They can, they've can risen to 12, 13, 14, 15, 16% of the uh, that means Sri Lanka is effectively shut out. So the ability to roll over foreign debt uh, is, I suppose, the most significant challenge that Sri Lanka has. And typically, of course, the rupee also depreciates over time against currencies in which we borrow and the foreign currencies. So the actual effective interest rate on international or foreign debt is much higher in rupee terms uh, than it is when it is denominated in the foreign currency. Uh, so let me just pause there as a way of understanding debt dynamics, and maybe later we can talk about the solutions. Uh, so to summarize, in terms of the debt dynamics, there is a simple test. Uh, Sri Lanka is coming to, I suppose, a critical point in that test. Uh, it's driven by two factors, uh, the debt to GDP ratio reaching 100%, uh, and the interest cost to revenue being the highest on record uh, at 60%. It's been at 45 or under, uh, and even under uh, and in the mid-30s uh, for, for, for the last 20 years. Uh, so the, the interest cost to revenue reaching 60%, I would say, is the critical uh, issue for Sri Lanka. Uh, and the problem is exacerbated by international sovereign bonds uh, being at such high yields that Sri Lanka is effectively priced out of international borrowing at the moment which causes a problem for rolling over the foreign debt, which is about 45% of the total debt that Sri Lanka has. Okay. Uh, Nishan, in the interest of time, since uh, we are running out of time, can, can you tell me the top three things Sri Lanka needs to do in the next three years? Super. I'll do that in one yeah. minute. Yeah. Um, I, I, number one, uh, grow your GDP, productivity, efficiency, 
Uh, growing out of debt is perhaps the best strategy. Professor Watavala talked about the importance of it. Uh, I think um, uh, the Honorable Nivad Kapura talked about it. Uh, and that's certainly, and, and, and I think Prabash talked about how he's doing that. Uh, that's a critical area in which the government has to keep its focus. Second, I think we have to regain access to global markets for borrowing uh, and, and reduce the cost of that borrowing by building. And the only way to do that is to build confidence in global markets about Sri Lanka by having a credible plan that others have a reason to believe in. Uh, I think that is where perhaps the government has to do significantly better. Uh, because at the moment, there is a lack of clarity about a credible plan and the downgrades that you spoke about uh, suggest that uh, the international markets and lenders and investors are not actually build, uh, growing in confidence. Uh, they are reducing in confidence and Sri Lanka needs to urgently find a method of reversing that. Last, um, I think, you know, there's this old saying that says when you find yourself in a hole, the first thing you must do is stop digging. Uh, so you have to manage the gap between revenue and expenditure downwards. This year, the budget deficit will be 10%. There's not much room, as uh, I think many, as, as, as uh, Honorable Nimad Kabra pointed out, to cut expenditure in times of COVID. So you have to really manage revenue significantly upwards uh, in a way that doesn't harm your, your GDP prospects also. So those are the top three things. Grow your GDP, regain the confidence of the international markets, and and reduce the gap between revenue and expenditure yeah before i move on to Garvin, one quick final question to you uh, do you think the downgrade was fair or not i i think uh Dinesh, let me put it this way it doesn't matter whether it was fair or not i think we should stop focusing on the on this question of are we victims or not and agree that perceptions matter uh, and as long as Sri Lanka is perceived to be not credible, I think uh, we have to focus on managing that. Uh, complaining that the, the, that the downgrade is unfair uh, can drive perception further in the negative direction. Uh, but accepting that we can do more to build confidence, I think, sends a positive signal. Okay, thank you. Uh, Gavan, can you hear me? I can, yes. Thank you, yeah, Thank you. Thank you for joining us from Australia. How is the COVID situation in Australia currently? So I'm in Melbourne is, and is I see someone else. Yeah. Um, it, is, it is improving, but um, I'm, in, I'm in Melbourne and we're still in lockdown. So we've been in okay. lockdown for about six months. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Hope things get better very, very soon. Uh, my question to you, uh, I have two questions. I'll try to keep it uh, short in the interest of time. My first question is, how, how will the world of work change in the new economy? Sorry, could you repeat that? So how would the world? Yeah, how will the world of work change in the new economy? Uh, yes. So that's that's a good, good question, and uh, Professor Luxman and others have, uh, and the minister spoke about people working from home. So what what we've seen is that people are now more uh, confident in using technologies and working from home. And we saw that transition very quickly. So I think that trend will continue. And we have data from Australia and elsewhere that points that um, both employees and employers are actually more comfortable now with people working from home, but not, not necessarily full time. The interesting question that then raises is how that will impact uh, cities, uh, urban planning, housing, and things like that. So in the US, we have now seen this shift to uh, the suburbs as people move out of inner city areas and to larger houses because they need more space to work from home. So the future work raises actually a lot more broader questions around uh, how uh, urban planning, how cities are developed. Uh, do we need, for example, to put as much money into public transport infrastructure? Uh, and do we need to put more money into the digital infrastructure? because we need to sustain people working from remote areas. So there's a whole lot of uh, broader factors which um, need to be considered as we shift a, a more quickly to working from home. And I, I'll say more quickly because this is a trend that has been going on in the Western world for some time, but it has accelerated. COVID-19 has accelerated that trend. And obviously what I hear from now in Sri Lanka is that that actually happened in Sri Lanka as well. 
So it's, it's a, not a temporary blip, that's a permanent shift. The extent of that permanent shift we'll probably see over the next year to 24 months. Uh, uh, given the challenges we have on our, re uh, on our resources, what are the areas we should be investing in now in order to protect our businesses in the future? So I, I think the major area of, of investment is on di digital transformation. So as I said before, COVID-19 has accelerated digital transformation. It's been a catalyst for us to try new technologies that we may not have tried in maybe two or three or four years time. So COVID-19 has accelerated that digital transformation, not only for consumers, but for business. And therefore business is gonna need more staff with digital skills. So uh, business will obviously need to invest in their staff or to find staff with those digital skills. For governments around the world, they're going, to, they're going to need to invest in the digital capability of their staff. And it's not just about you know, the IT person who ends up in Silicon Valley, it's also about us as accountants and the ability of us as accountants to use digital skills, but also to be a partner with, uh, a partner with your IT section. So that they're making the right decisions on the technologies that will move their business forward, improve their efficiency. And some of the technologies you'll be looking at is robotic process automation, artificial intelligence. I think they're sort of the major, and data analytics, they're the major technologies that are, that are proven, that are, they're now became more commercially available and will have proven ability to deliver efficiencies for business. And uh, as I say, uh, us as accountants need to understand those technologies better and to be able to apply them in our business situation. Yeah. Uh, in terms of education delivery, what kind of changes would you see in the next five years? So I don't want to steal a thunder at the next session, but uh, obviously <laughs> I'm more focusing on digital technology and digital delivery of courses, but also people are going to break down courses. So the, the more traditional four-year degree people might shift to what they call micro-credentialing. So smaller degrees in more bite sizes, um, rather than the traditional face-to-face -face learning where you sit there and you lecture at. All the things that we went through as, as young people going to university, I think that has changed and will, that change will accelerate. And people are now learning in 20 minute blocks, 40 minute blocks, not, not sitting there for two hours and they're learning from their smartphone. They're not learning in a classroom. So that, that, that'll be accelerated. The consequence of that is that all the extracurricular activity that's centered around universities, that will diminish. So how will these new graduates have the skills, those interpersonal skills, those, those soft skills necessary to make them good employees? Okay, uh, and what is, your, what is your elevator message to the accountants? The message to the accountants is- uh, Elevator message, elevator message. The message is uh, learn more about technology. You don't have to be a technology specialist, but understand the technology that's out there. Ask questions, be curious, uh, learn more. And, and, and for people who are old, older, like myself, to team up with someone who's younger. One person talking to another. Uh, an older accountant talking to a younger accountant. As a mentor, you can also learn from a younger accountant on the technologies that are out there and how to apply them. Thank you. Uh, Nishan, there's a question for you here. Can you hear me? Nishan? Yes, I can. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the question uh, says, uh, does Sri Lanka in invest enough on research and development? Uh, the first question, what part should research play in driving this new economy? So I think that's been something historically spoken about over a long period, uh, where people produce uh, ratios that show that the investment on research in Sri Lanka is relatively low compared to other uh, middle income economies or even economies that are smaller uh, per capita than Sri Lanka is. Uh, I think um, I might switch the strategy to say it's not just about counting the money, it's counting the effectiveness of the money. Uh, so as you know, I mean, take for example, agriculture, uh, Prabash will know we have many, many research institutes in that area. 
uh, there are there's a nanotechnology institute so well, i think rather than just worrying about how much we spend and certainly that needs to go sri lanka may need to put its research institutes and i think we are well placed to do that now with the professionalizing of the bureaucracy uh, into kpis and say how do we look at the value for money uh, in the from the research institutes that we have uh, and how do we hold them to improving productivity in the country and invest according to their capacity to bring a positive change through research so i would approach it that way not just by targeting a ratio okay thank you uh, dushni there's a question for you uh, can you hear me can do dinesh yeah the question is what changes do you env envisage uh, 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 yeah uh, sorry are the current policies in the country suitable for the post covid new economy and what changes do we require well i think the um, uh, policies that have been rolled out in the short term are there to manage this um, shock and and then as we've uh, been hearing today these include import controls uh, ways and means of trying to preserve the foreign exchange we have given the debt settlements on our hands etc um but as we go along and certain sort of we see a, a sustained or at least a recovery taking root we might need to um, rethink some of those policies i think nishan um, alluded to some of it in terms of fiscal sustainability um but beyond um that i think also what are the drivers of growth that sri lanka can um reasonably expect to um, see us through to the next 3 years are we going to um focus on export driven growth or are we going to look at domestic um, production and consumption driven growth uh, i think there will be a um, not just a debate nationally but this is a global a uh, debate that's uh, taking place because the kinds of stimulus measures and unconventional pol um, policies that we've adopted now is in in some sense seeing a shift towards more populist policies uh, and sri lanka will certainly be a part of that um, larger uh, debate and uh, rethinking of what policies fit uh, for a post covid recovery okay well, one quick question uh, uh, you talk you have been talking a lot about poverty and the impact it's had, the, the the current crisis is having on poverty what are your thoughts around that well if you look at the um, uh, pre existing conditions i mean sri lanka was seeing a widening of income inequality uh, in recent years and i my sense and that uh, the research that my colleagues are doing at ips suggests that uh, covid is going to entrench some of those inequalities um two three reasons one is that the um uh, those who are most adversely impacted are the poorer um sections of the population those who are without social protection i mean i think all of us know the numbers so uh, in formal sector employment etc we were talking about technology and uh, working from home again it is those with the skills with the um access to computers access to internet all of it who will benefit from that uh, again we might see therefore that uh, in and in the future um uh, world of work um we is going to be disadvantages to um workers who are um forced to go to factories or manual workers bargaining power of workers will also be weakened because of um, covid and you know vulnerabilities to loss of employment so all in all i think inequality is bound to widen unless we keep a very sharp eye on it and implement um, targeted policies through fiscal um, policies etc to ensure that that um, doesn't get out of hand thank you uh, wish there's a question for you here can you hear me yes please. wish yeah uh, the question is how can the private sector help the government to navigate the country through these difficult times uh that's a very open question uh i i think what the private sector is uh, doing like i said is to make sure uh that uh, the uh, employment is kept alive uh private sector is uh, definitely reskilling uh from the uh, current skill levels that they have if you look at our uh, entire tourism sector 
uh, they are reskilling the workforce to do other things uh, if you look at that the apparel sector from stitching regular garments they were able to quickly uh, uh, change over to the uh, pandemic requirements of the PPE, masks, et cetera. So, uh, you know, private sector can uh, easily change. This is not the first challenge the private sector has faced in Sri Lanka. Uh, I mean, we have faced a war, we have faced a tsunami, we have faced a terrorism. Uh, now we are facing a pandemic. So the private sector has always been resilient through all this. Uh, this, this whole debt issue with the government is not new. We have been in worse conditions. Uh, we are resilient. We always, uh, you know, bounce back. But uh, we also need help. You know, we need direction. We need stability. Uh, you know, we need uh, a logistics uh, change, infrastructure improvement. In the last uh, five to ten years, infrastructure has improved. But we need much more uh, infrastructure improvement. Uh, for example, our railway, uh, this is an, you know, this is something pathetic. After so many years of independence, we're struggling with the archaic railway system. Uh, something that can really help the private sector business. Uh, moving from A to B takes a long time. So there are some, you know, uh, easy things that the government can do, which the private sector can't do. Uh, cost of energy. We are probably the single most costliest energy uh, in, in this entire region. Uh, so we need to do something about it. Uh, so those are the things I think what the government can do and what the private sector will do. Yeah, uh, I wish you run a big empire in, in, in terms of your, uh, your vision for your company and stuff like that. Uh, uh, what kind of jobs do you think will disappear in the next five years? Uh, jobs uh, that will disappear, like I said, uh, is people who cannot uh, adapt to technology, cannot adapt to digital. Uh, so those uh, jobs uh, will have to disappear. But like I said, it's not about just laying off people. It's about reskilling people. Uh, so we really believe in reskilling and uh, re-empowering people. That's, that's, that's what a good employer should do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Prabash, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, the, there are two questions for you. The what support does EDB provide to exporters to navigate this, navigate through these difficult times? So we do different things. As I said before, we do a lot of uh, market uh, foreign missions to make sure that the companies can find buyers, etc. Then second, we're rolling out uh, uh, exporters reward scheme for this quarter and the next quarter it will be announced officially in the budget. And then we do a lot of facilitation in terms of policy issues, we try to resolve these issues that they have. So businesses can operate much more faster and be more agile. Uh, the, the next question is the current apparel industry is 35% of our export uh, mix. How will this change in the next five years? I would see uh, other new sectors becoming bigger exports sectors for Sri Lanka. So I don't think the apparel sector is going to disappear. I think it will stay in its own form. I mean, we've looked at exports of multiple competing countries in the region over the last 25 years. We've seen some traditional export um, sectors surviving 20 or 30 years. But the only difference is we've seen new areas, for example, things like electronics or uh, in, in terms of digital solutions, where they have come and grown to be a very large sectors. So I think the apparel sector is here to stay, but in terms of a growth story, we'd be looking at new sectors to grow the export uh, of Sri Lanka. And I think that would become much bigger than what apparel is today. Yeah. Next question is how can the chambers collaborate with EDB to uh, build up our export potential? We work with everyone, not only a chamber. I've got people sometimes calling me at 10 o'clock in the night, saying they need a curfew pass organized. So, we are open to collaboration. Anybody can write to us, call us, and contact us. We are happy to work with all chambers or other private organizations. Our job is to facilitate and get businesses to go into the export market, look at opportunities, and monetize on those opportunities. So we are ready to serve. Yeah. yeah. As the head of EDV, what really keeps you up at night? <laughs> well, that's, a, uh, that's a good question. Uh, I would say that I think our lack of preparedness for the current COVID crisis that we are going through would be the biggest concern that I have right now. 
I think we lived in this wonderful bubble and our society also got used to this incredible situation that we lived in a COVID bubble where the rest of the world moved forward. And I think we are now scrambling to understand how to operate businesses in a COVID environment. I think that's the single biggest challenge we have for the export sector right now, because we need to now deal with the virus and still have business continuity. And the way it's escalating right now, I mean, this afternoon, the Gampa district was locked. So things like that, we've got 600 exporting companies in the Gampa district. That's 25% of our export base. And we've got some of the largest exporters in that area. I need them to operate. So as a government, we are ready to get them to operate. But I think our businesses were not prepared for this because of such a long duration of, of being complacent to some extent. So I would say that's the biggest challenge that we're facing right now. Thank you. Thank you. Renga, there are, Renga, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, there are a whole lot of questions, but I'll try to summarize them. <laughs> First is, what are the banks doing to de-risk their balance sheet, given the huge moratoriums that you are given? Well, now most of the moratoriums are over, and except for the tourism and tourism-related uh, business entrepreneurs uh, and individual borrowers, uh, facilities are going to be extended further for six months time period. So I think out of the 30-35% uh, facilities which went under moratorium, uh, nearly about half of them have come out of that or more than half of them have come out of the moratorium. So there again, I think all the banks and the bank teams have, you know, borrowers and discussed with them and found out what is the real new cash flow position of borrowers and uh, arrange repayment programs accordingly. So with that, I think uh, majority of the customers who took this moratorium during the COVID crisis, initial crisis, have to come up with a realistic repayment program. If the banks have very realistic uh, repayment arrangements for these customers, if you take even our bank, we had about five different uh, schemes that was launched uh, to look at different types of scenarios of the customers and uh, come up with a uh, very appropriate uh, repayment arrangement for them. So if they have come up with that right repayment program, I think these customers will continue to repay. But one thing we need to understand, the bankers need to understand also, we cannot be you know, having a rigid rule in regard to recovery. We need to be more flexible and we need to give time, extended time period sometimes to uh, you know, recover uh, our dues. So if you are more practical and realistic, I think we should be able to manage this situation. But in regard to the facility which are in the moratorium, uh, mainly for tourism sectors, again, we need to be patient enough. There again, my uh, view is actually some of these accounts will definitely be able to repay provided once these airports are open and uh, but not according to the previous uh, repayment period, but maybe uh, with an extended repayment period. So we have to be more practical to look after their issues and support them, Dinesh. That, that's what I would okay. say. Uh, my final question for the entire panel to close this, uh, uh, and I will ask you to take one minute and respond, starting with Re Mr. Ranganathan. If the pandemic drags on for another year, what do we need to do during the next 12 months to get ready for the new economy? I'm just going to go on for another 12 months means I think we should, now if I look at it from the banking sector, we, there are certain liquidity issues which, we, which, we, which may crop up. So the banks which have uh, lower liquidity levels need to beef up their liquidity positions and banks which have you know, maybe not sufficient buffer in their capital adequacy also need to you know, beef up their capital positions. And uh, because be patient in regard to the recovery because as long as when the pandemic continues, the chances of recovery of uh, facilities that we have extended would be a uh, bit, bit difficult. So that's how I would say from the banker's point of view. Thank you. Uh, Prabash? Yeah, I, I don't think it's an if anymore. I think the pandemic is here for at least the next year or longer. So I've heard you saying that it's if, but I don't think so. I think businesses need to be resilient. You need to focus on cash. End of the day, turnover is vanity, profit is sanity, and cash is reality. You need to really focus on cash and conserve as much cash as possible. And also you need to build an agile business to deal with the environment that's around you. Thank you. Uh, Dushni? I think I would just say it's digitization. Companies are going to be looking at e-commerce. 
uh, and second, um, and which was mentioned earlier, technology, because remote presence is going to be absolutely critical. And I think firms uh, and governments have to start investing in these two three areas. Uh, Nishan? Dinesh, if I just speak to the issue I discussed on debt and sustainability, I agree with Prabash that uh, we must take this as a given, uh, which means that the planning and the way in which we approach solutions to uh, the fiscal side, uh, as well as the debt side, uh, can't be overly short term. Uh, it has, we have to have a medium term plan. Uh, it has to take the reality into account. Uh, and we cannot afford to live uh, hand to mouth month by month um, and, and watching and adjusting um, uh, as if something uh, is going to materialize and rescue us suddenly tomorrow. Uh, one of the reasons most countries get into serious debt difficulties is because they wait too long and postpone too long uh, some of the critical things that need to be done. So I would say the most important thing for Sri Lanka right now is to take a medium term view and work to a credible plan uh, in managing its debt and managing the government uh, fiscal side. Thank you. That's a very powerful line. Uh, yeah. Gavin? Uh, thank you. So for business, I would say over the next 12 months, look for efficiencies, focus on cash, cost reduction, um, do the digitization, focus on that, and look to reimagine and reinvent your business. The business you have now is going to be very different in 12 months' time. So look at that. From the government point of view, uh, stimulus spending. We know we had this discussion around about uh, the debt in Sri Lanka, but stimulus spending is going to be essential, but also support for business and for support particularly for those uh, poorer in society. They're going to need that real support from government over the next 12 months if the virus continues or when the virus continues. Thank you. I wish you can have the last word. Uh, thanks, Dinesh. So I think uh, everything has been said from cash to technology to etc. Uh, but for private sector business, I think what will be important in the next 12 months is to focus on supply chain management because trade is shifting. Uh, for example, because of the U.S.-China uh, 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 tensions, almost 38% of their imports have now reduced from China. So all those imports will have to be gotten from the rest of the world. Similarly, China will have to sell all those exports to somewhere else. So somewhere in there, Sri Lanka has to benefit. So we have to focus on supply chain management, inventory control, and cost reduction, which will all relate to having sufficient cash in hand. So that's, that's how I see it. Uh, thank you, Vish. And uh, over to Professor Matavale to, to close up the session. Thank you, guys. Thank, uh, thank you, uh, Dinesh. I think uh, it was a very, very e excellent uh, panel discussion. A lot of the matters that came out, I think, was really of uh, practical importance uh, to all our participants. I think all our panelists, I think, played a major role. Uh, I think uh, we were very happy. Uh, we were for, fortunate to have such a eminent panel with us because if you look at all of them, I think uh, uh, starting from the export development to the chambers of commerce, uh, from the uh, banking sector to the Institute of Policy Studies uh, to Verit Research uh, and CPA Australia. And of course, I think uh, the excellent manner in which uh, the moderation was done by Mr. Dinesh Virakudi, I think I must especially pay a very, very... Uh, 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 credit uh, very a lot of credit to him for the excellent session which went off very well and the questions that were raised were really of uh, importance to everyone and I'm sure uh, the start that was given by the, uh, and, uh, the uh, support uh, that is going to give to the private sector will also be shared by you all. So let me thank all of you uh, the uh, panelists and all our participants uh, for, I'm sure you would have all benefited by it. And uh, let me uh, once again, thank you. And uh, I do hope that maybe uh, once things are normal, we'll be uh, able to get together and have a small celebration. Thank you officially. So let me once again thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
uh, certified management accountants of Sri Lanka and wish you all the best. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very Thank you. much. Yeah. I, I just want to make a small announcement. Uh, we will have a short uh, break, uh, maybe a, a 10 minute or five, five to eight minute break, uh, and uh, where we reset the stage for the next uh, uh, session that's on repositioning higher and professional education in the next economy. I can see that uh, many of them are already here. So uh, uh, we'll just take about uh, five to eight minutes to set it up and get uh, started and also give a short break to our participants. The professor Mangi video disabled. Karindu? Karindu? Okay, okay. Uh, we will correct the situation. Karindu. Uh, we, uh, okay. Uh, now see, uh, now can you try? Uh, okay. Yeah, probably. Now. Yeah, now you're okay. Yeah, now you're okay. How about the others? Uh, Chandra, are you there? Professor Ho, uh, just, uh, Professor Ho, can you uh, just make yes, a small... Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, All I right. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, fine. Uh, not the name. I think we have to uh, rename. Okay, Professor Ho. No, not your one. Not your one. Sorry. My one is okay, no? The one is okay, Professor Ho. I think uh, you can see Professor Ho, there is... Uh, how are, how are all of you? Thank you so yeah, much. I'll, I'll correct you. Oh, sorry about that. It's uh, okay. That's fine. Okay. Uh, now it's corrected. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And, uh, just uh, the attendance. Uh, Manil Lakmika is there. Lorita, you're there. I think all of you all can. Uh, uh, unmute your video so that uh, you can be seen. Lorita, Paul, you are there? Okay. Yep, I'm good. Okay. Professor Narendra, you can unmute. Uh, yes, Dr. Professor. Okay. Okay, Dr. Professor Ali Kadbi. Ali Kadbi. Professor, Professor, you are there, Ali Kadbi? <coughs> Lorita, yeah, okay. I think only Professor Alikatbi is not responding. Manil, you are there? Manil, you can unmute. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah, you, okay, fine, fine, yeah. Then, Professor Ali Kadbi, are you there?
Shanti. He's there, but he's not responding. Hmm? Maybe he's not here. Okay, uh, I think uh, Dilani, Dilani, you're there? Dilani, there? Yes, yes, Professor, I am. I think uh, we are. Professor Lakmika, shall we start then? Uh, okay. Yes, well, I think we can go ahead. Yeah. Um, okay, well, then uh, why don't you uh, do the introductions, Dilani? All right, sure. Welcome back. And as we move to the second session of the day themed repositioning higher and professional education in the next economy. We have an introduction to the session by Mr. H.M. Hinnayaka Bandara, Vice President, CMA Sri Lanka, followed by Professor Harindra Kariyavasam, Professor in Accounting, Head of the Department of Accounting, University of Sri Tavadhanapura, and Council Member, CMA Sri Lanka. We are honored by your presence and the platform is yours. Uh, thank you, Dilani. Good evening to all of you, ladies and gentlemen. I think you will agree with me that uh, we had a very successful inauguration session on the subject of uh, overcoming COVID-19 impact and navigating to the next economy. Moving on to the current session, repositioning higher and professional education in the next economy. We have a total of uh, around uh, 110 minutes for the session, including for question and answers. To talk about this subject, we have with us a panel of experts in the field of education from Singapore, Australia, Sri Lanka, and Malaysia representing high-end professional educational institutions. On behalf of CMA, it is my pleasure to welcome our co-chairman, Professor Harinder Karyosam, keynote speaker, Professor Ho, moderator, associate Professor Lakmika Perra. Let me also welcome Panelists, Professor Paul Mehta, Mr. Manil Jaisinger, Mr. Drew, Ms. Marim, Marim, Professor Ali, Ms. Loretta, Dr. Chandra Ambuldenia, and all participants for the second session of our virtual conference 2020. Ladies and gentlemen, the pandemic that has shattered economies around the world has also affected the education systems around the world. Almost all tertiary learners are no longer able to physically attend their classes. The impact has been dramatic and transformative as educators scramble to put in place workable short-term solutions for remote teaching and learning particularly in emerging markets where students face additional challenges such as infrastructure, skills, and means to finance remote learning. COVID-19 has stuck our education system like a lightning ball and shaken it to its core. Just as the first industrial revolution forged today's system of education. We can expect a different kind of educational model to emerge from COVID-19 that will have a dramatic impact on the next economy. I'm sure that you all will be able to get gain some valuable insight through this session. With that note, let me invite our Co-Chairman Professor Harindra, also to make few comments on the subject matter. Thereafter, Ms. Dilani Jayadilaka will introduce the keynote speaker, moderator, panelist, and invite the keynote speaker to deliver his speech. Thank you. Over to you, Professor Harindra. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Hidnaika Bandara. I won't take much time. 
as we are experiencing currently, the COVID-19 pandemic has disrupted our lives in several ways. However, we have initiated our normal doing back with all pros and cons of COVID-19. One of the sectors which was highly affected by COVID-19 is higher education. Uh, so in a global survey conducted by the International Association of Universities on the impact of COVID-19 on higher education around the world, 59% of the higher education institutes have responded that they have stopped all campus activities. And the institution is completely closed due to COVID-19, but there are many higher education institutes which continue their teaching activities through online lectures. Even though it is good alternative, there are many challenges too. As an example, if we consider Sri Lankan state universities, such institutes especially concerned about assessment methods. So, but there is a clear problem about the validity and reliability of online assessment methods. Another challenge is the concern on the mental health of students. University is a place where students interact with each other and engage in academic and extracurricular activities a lot. But COVID-19 has limited that interaction among students. So in a joint research conducted by International Association of Universities, an Erasmus student network, it has revealed that students may face many mental health issues like uh, anxiety and isolation during this outbreak and they need due support to prevent such situation. So COVID-19 is a clearly challenge, but we have to find ways to live with it. So I hope we will be able to listen to very rich keynote speech and panel discussion on this topic. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much, heartiest well wishes from SHM Hinaika Bandara and Professor Harendra Khairiya Vasam. We are also utmost honored by the presence of Professor Oyeki with us today. Professor Oyeki is a professor of accounting at the Singapore Institute of Technology. He is the Associate Provost, Skills, Future and Staff Development of Singapore Institute of Technology. He is a former professor of accounting at the National University of Singapore. He is also a professor of accounting at SIT. He is currently a director of a listed insurance company in the Singapore Stock Exchange. He serves as chairman of various nominations, human resource and investment committees of charities. Professor Hoye Ki is a member of the Advisory Council Institute of Certified Management Accountants of Sri Lanka and sits on the Council of CPA Australia, the Singapore chapter. Over to you, sir, for the keynote address. Thank you very much. Uh, let me put up my PowerPoint as it is. All right. Uh, good. Good afternoon to all of you. Thank you so much for having me in this uh, session. I really appreciate the time uh, to be able to spend with all of you. Today, I'm going to talk about the repositioning higher and professional education in the next economy. One way to look at the current world that we are in is to see the COVID-19 as nothing more than a simple dress rehearsal for what the world will be like. I think COVID-19 has forced all of us to rethink through technology. If there is no online technology, I believe all universities and schools will be ground to a halt as it is. Likewise, for accounting firm, right? If without the technology, many audits would not have been possible. So one way to look at COVID-19 is to see this as almost like a window as how the future will look like. So it is with this challenge that we need to ask ourselves the key questions. What would higher education or how should we reposition higher education and even the professional education in the next economy? Right. So, right. The attributes of the next economy, I like to believe, is predicated upon automation, artificial intelligence, connectivity in terms of the Internet of Things, digital, and information. But all these are what we so call the technologies of the future or the technologies of today. But I think we must not miss out the central piece of this. 
all these technologies are made possible through human creativity. So in that sense, the next economy must leverage on the human creativity vis-a-vis uh, -vis the advancements in terms of technology. The key technology uh, mega trends that will transform production. And the World Economic Forum in 2018 basically talks about how the key technology will change the way production are to be done. For example, in terms of intelligence, the artificial intelligence advances in computing power and the availability of big data will allow machine learning algorithms to excel. I remember in the 80s when I was at Monash University in Australia, we were then dealing with expert system where we were able to ask a question, can we build an expert system around audit such that when there is a particular combinations of observations, we will be able through the expert system come to an audit conclusion. Those were already in existence in the 80s, but we did not have the computing power to make those things happen. But today with artificial intelligence, we can, right? Because of the power of computing. The next thought pattern we have is about connectivity, right? In the sense of how rapidly the world has changed, right? Through the connecting of various nexus, right? Take an example, working from home. Working from home is only possible because companies have central servers or their data, or alternatively, the workspace are contained in the cloud such that the individual can connect and continue to work through this connectivity. There will also be flexible automation. WEF, World Economic Forum has said that 60% of all our current manufacturing tasks are done through automation. And this will continue to climb because automation is at best in doing repetitive things with minimal error as it is, much better than any human beings can ever do. In terms of the progression of artificial intelligence, it is frightening. Frightening in the sense that we started off with the existing intelligence, automating repetitive, standardized or time-consuming tasks and providing assisted intelligence. Think about this, that we have always been using this. Think about macros in the Excel spreadsheet. This is assisted intelligence because we program a macro in the Excel spreadsheet that allows us to do the same particular routine over and over again by the clicking of a button. This is existed intelligence. But we'll move also into a world of augmented intelligence in which the uniquely human traits will interact with machines to come to good decisions that requires man and human to coexist with each other. I guess the most frightening part of it is to move into autonomous intelligence. Can you imagine a world in one day where there are no drivers, physical drivers, in which the car will move by themselves autonomously. Interestingly, this is not new. Some of the bullet trains have already happened where there are no drivers, in which the whole system is running on autonomous intelligence. And uh, the way uh, PwC who produced this report basically asked the question, the future of humans at work is therefore being questioned. So these are the top 10 skills of the future. And this was a report produced in 2016 by World Economic Forum on the future of jobs. And back then, as we reflect on 2015, the five top skills of the future in 2015 that was complex problem solving, coordinating with others, people management, critical thinking, negotiation. And you realize that these are uniquely human, uniquely human so-called uh, 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 devices, right? And the ability of human beings. And they forecast into 2020, which is what we are right now, that the complex solving skills is still highly sought after. Critical thinking, creativity, people management, coordinating with others. In fact, one of the key words or phrases in, in the education today is this thought pattern called design thinking, right? Where we think and we design systems, structure, product, services in an orderly manner by re-looking at how it is being set up. And all these are predicated upon the human uniqueness of the future. So this is uh, WEF 2016, when you look at the future of works by partitioning all right, the future cross core work related skills. On one part, you have the activities, abilities, I mean, cognitive part of it, the physical part of it. You see, 
we must not underestimate the importance and the dynamics of the human being in terms of our abilities because it took a robot a long, long, long time to hold an egg without crushing it as it is. Right. So these are non-trivial so-called physical attributes of human beings in which we try to mimic using machines. Then you have the basic skill. The content skills in terms of literacy, learning, writing, expression. The processing skills in terms of critical thinking, monitoring self and others. And then we move into this one so far the cross-functional skills where we suddenly realize having just the technical skills in operating the machine, in being a good accountant, being a good architect is probably not sufficient. We need to move into the world of social skills, learning how to uh, manage our emotional intelligence, negotiation, persuasions, and then the system skills in terms of doing system analysis, judgment, and decision making. And above all else, by uniquely human, we need to deal with our complex problem solving skills. And all these plus the resource management skills. You may ask, why are these relevant? And I'm going to example all of these into a framework and share with you that this is what is going to define higher education and professional education in years to come. So we have the skills which are uniquely human, the cognitive skills, the physical skills, the content skills, the process skills, the complex problem solving skills, resource management skills, social skills, system skills. I would like to suggest in today's world, because of emergence technology, we also need the skills to manage technology. And in terms of the technical skills in managing the technology, we need to know things like machine skill, the programming, the quality control, uh, technology, user experience design, troubleshooting. And in terms of digital technology, we need to be able to understand at least what are the fundamental digital technology that's driving the world. Recently, I took a, a module in CPA Australia on the digital finance, all right? I have to retool myself concerning what are some of the digital skills or in fact, the language that's needed in the world of digital finance. In this digital skills, it covers all the sophisticated and complex things, ranging from mobile internet in which your handphone become a bank because of PayPal or because of all those uh, uh, apps that allows you to move money digitally, electronically from your bank into the vendors in which you buy your things from. Right? So let me give you a simple example. This is a simple standard binomial pricing tree. It is a random walk with a positive tree, right? It's a random walk because there is a 50% chances of up and down at each day. I only use four days as an example. And it is a, this defines a random walk part of it, 50% chance up and down, and there's no memory in it. And it is a positive tree because the, the uptick is 5%, the downtick is minus 3%. That means over time, you realize that you will be positively upward sloping. You start out with $100,000 in day zero, all right? And based on this computation in four days, a random walk with a positive drift, you are on expectation get about $104.60 as it is, all right? $104.60, all right? Okay, now I switch the whole uh, thought pattern into a, into a world in which it is still a random walk, uh, but it is still a binomial, standard binomial pricing tree, but now with a correlated walk with a positive dream. That means you start out with the price up and down with 50%, but whenever you have a positive tick, your, you would have a higher chances of 60% for another positive tick. The reversal chance is only 40%. And we call these a standard binomial pricing tree correlated walk with a positive dream. Ladies and gentlemen, we have done this easily using a spreadsheet. But don't forget, this is only for four days. What if you have a financial instrument that lasts for 100 days and your tree, unfortunately, will be very large? So as a new, as an old dog, I learned new tricks. I went to learn how to do Python code and programming. Using 35 lines in the Python code, and this is not the most efficient code. This is, it, it is a code that I just quickly write within 10 minutes as it is. In 35 lines, I can program this binomial tree for me to run 5 million rounds of simulations 
and the expected value is about $104,171, and the error margin is 0.001%. And this entire program will run only for 12.6 seconds with 5 million reiterations. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the world of technology. Welcome to the world in which if you are an accountant of the next generation, and if you do not have this digital skill, you will have significant difficulties competing with the rest of the accountants in this world. So this is where I'm coming to introduce for us how education will need to change. In the good old days, the education in the 80s, 70s, or even earlier, we have what is called traditional higher education in which it is a pillar approach. All we are interested in is to train the accountants based on the structured core knowledge of accounting. We do financial accounting, auditing, management accounting, tax, valuation, and all those things that pause us deep as an accountant. Somewhere along the line, we decided to make some changes. And the some changes that we made was to introduce the concept of soft skills. Examples of soft skills will be communication, listening, negotiation, persuasion, presentation, public speaking, reading body language, storytelling, writing skills. That means we no longer just want to have an accountant that's technically steep, but he's also a human being, an ability to communicate, ability to persuade and negotiate as it is. We call these the T-shaped approach of uh, education. And I'd like to suggest that this is the dominant uh, education paradigm of today, right? Because we expect the universities, we expect a professional not only to be steeped in terms of technical knowledge, but he is a salesman. He's a communicator. He has the ability to persuade and his ability to communicate. May I suggest that this may not be enough because we enter into the world of digital skills. And I want to introduce to us this, what we so-call the I-shaped approach, in which we will have the soft skills on top, the pillars of the deep technical skills that's entrenched, and we must build that foundation on digital skills. And the examples of digital skills will be your data intuition skills, your data communications and visualization, all about data wrangling, ability to purge plans data so that you're able to fit them into machines that allow them to do machine learning. Robotic processing and automation is something that's really been introduced in the accounting world. By taking a photograph or scanning an invoices, it can do automatic posting as it is. The programming skills and languages, which I just showed you, 5 million reiterations, simulations, within 12.6 seconds, over 35 lines of codes as it is, right? The network information security, the critical thinking in terms of how the system works, artificial intelligence and web analytics are just some examples of the digital skills. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what I think the future of education is going to look like, particularly for the higher education. And the crucial question for higher education institutions and even professional bodies will be these few questions. What are the key digital skills? How deep should the digital skill training be? How and where do I start? Life has a humorous. I moved from anywhere as the head of department of accounting to SIT to become the, the associate provost in skills future. My bosses had redeployed me back to the uh, department of accounting to head the department of accounting, particularly to look at the digital accounting. How can I train digital accountants? Or how can I intertwine the skills, the digital skills that I have in my ICT the, the Infocom uh, technology uh, faculty, together with accountants to train a brand new breed of, I call them nerds accountants, or maybe the digital accountants as it is. So these are to me very cru crucial questions, right? Some of the key challenges in building this digital foundation. It is a very crowded and busy accounting and finance curriculum, right? Three years, four years program, I always remember in the 80s, when I went to university, there were probably only about 11 accounting standards, 250 pages. We memorized everything as it is. But today, we've got 40 accounting standards, more than 2,000 pages or, or, or guidelines as it is. But yet, the accounting training is still three years or four years. How are we going to cram so many new things in the same time period for a degree program? There's insufficient time at the university. And one of the issues that we constantly struggle with is the lack of educators in the digital domain space. 
it is very hard to be able to find educators, accountants who can do programming, who understand how to use and deploy digital skills in the steep uh, domain of auditing, forensic accounting, or even financial accounting, or even finance, building uh, models to allow us to do complex computation. There are lack of resources to pursue digital education too, right? And I find that one of the challenges we have is the lack of urgency and digital roadmap. In fact, I'd like to believe or even believe over the fact that actually many educators know that this is the future, but they don't know how to start. They don't know where to start for that matter. Same thing with the professional bodies, right? 2016, I was asked to help to uh, uh, provide input into the CMA professional education where we revise the syllabus as it is. And one of the things that we introduced into the syllabus was automation or digital uh, 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 infocom technology, right? We knew then in 2016, the infocom technology must be introduced into the professional, professional curriculum because this is going to be an important piece in the future. And I, I like to say too, one of the challenges for traditional universities or universities of today we are too entrenched in the traditional mode of education, right? We, we don't know how to break out of this traditional mode to introduce new topics or new discipline that cross over to another domain. Let me give you some thoughts and then I'll wrap up. Some thoughts on how to start. I think there must be a will to seize the opportunities. It has to be a total commitment and the lead must be from the top. You need to get knowledgeable and visionary leaders. I am going back to schools. Right. If I were to create digital accountants, I have to be retrained because I'm an old dog. Right. Uh, my programming skills is to a, only a certain degree. I can do better as it is, but it is very hard to train old dogs with new tricks. See, right. So this is where from the top, the leaders who are going to make the decision, they must not be afraid of the new technology. They must take the bull by the horn and basically say, we will lead from the top. And we will learn from the top as it is. For universities and professional bodies, maybe you need to set up task force to curate a new educational roadmap. You need to redesign your curriculum, redesign your education. My accounting faculty were very good as it is, right? They decided to put data visualization into our curriculum, right? And break them up into pieces as it is, so that our people will know how to do data mining, data visualization, because we know that the frontier that we're going to compete with is all about information and data. But I ask the question, is this enough? Is it good enough just to know how to use quicksand? Is it good enough just to know how to use data visualization software, as it is, uh, power, uh, 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 PI power, uh, uh, or those power uh, PI, as it is, Excel spreadsheet, right? I ask a more fundamental question. Should we train accountants to know how to do coding? And let me put before you the case. If we train our students to know how to use data visualization, they will be tied down to softwares, right? They will tie down to basically how to use tools to help them to do data visualization, but they will never be able to understand what is inside the black box. But when the people start learning the basic foundation in coding, they will know how to build the black box. And this is what is going to make a lot of difference as it is. The jury is still out. I'm still wrangling with my faculty concerning how do we further modernize our curriculum because of the limited time that we have there. We have to acquire the resources, the manpower, the technology. We have to send our people to upgrade their skills as it is and to bring back the technology. There must be a clear way to execute the plans, faithful, diligent, systematic. And finally, I would like to believe there must be milestones evaluation. We need to track concerning what is our progression like as it is, right? We want to track, are we moving closer to our goals of having a digital accountant? And my final size is this. The disruption in the next economy can be seen like this cup of water, half cup of water. We can see it as a half cup of water. There are plenty of opportunities. There are creative redesigning, reskilling, new opportunities, and they are also uniquely human in which we human can rise to the top in terms of creativity. But unfortunately too, the challenges is that we can be overwhelmed. We can be lost or paralyzed, ill-equipped, 
entry. In fact, we may be in such that we don't even know where to start for that matter. So ladies and gentlemen, may I suggest that the opportunity is tremendous as it is, all right? And thank you for this opportunity where I can share with you uh, my struggle as an educator. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. And that was Professor Hui Ki, Professor of Accounting at the Singapore Institute of Technology. Next on agenda is our second panel discussion for the day, moderated by Professor Lakmika Pereira, Director of Education at the Center for Integrated Reporting, Faculty of Business and Law, Deakin University. Joining us as panelists are Professor Paul Martha, an advisory council member of CMA Sri Lanka, and a professor at the Ladrobe University in Melbourne. Mr. Manil Jai Singh, President, CA Sri Lanka. Mr. Drew Collin, Director of Education and Lifelong Learning, CIPSA. Ms. Mariam Reza, President, Intergenerational Consulting, Watlshaw in Melbourne, Australia. Professor Dr. Ali Khatibi, Senior Vice President and Dean of the Postgraduate Center in Malaysia. Ms. Lorita Ross, Senior Manager, Professional Development, Member Education, CP Australia, and Dr. Chandra Mbudenia, Chairman, Experts Committee for the Feasibility Study of the National Sports University, and the Founder Vice Chancellor of the Ove Lhasa University of Sri Lanka. May I also remind all participants to send up questions via the chat or Q&A to be answered by our panelists. Over to you, Professor Lakmika Pereira. Thank you so much. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And thank you so much for the panelists from joining us from all different time frames, and also uh, my fellow Australian uh, panelists, uh, where we are now approaching 10 p.m. So thank you so much. OK, uh, so the format for the day is I will um, invite uh, each panelist to give a three to five minute spiel on how they view uh, in terms of repositioning higher education and professional education in the next economy. So to start off the session, I would like to invite Loretta to uh, give you a little spiel on how you see uh, education going forward in the next economy. Thank you. Thank you, Lakmika. I hope that uh, the slides are able to be shared. I believe there's a couple to share, if that's OK. Lovely. Thank you. All right, if you go to the next slide, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here to contribute to the session on repositioning higher education uh, in the next economy. So um, as we all know, the role of the accountant or the finance professional is changing rapidly, especially with the introduction of new technology and global digital disruption, as we've heard. There are new ways to digitally connect. There are more contract opportunities as part of what we know now as a gig economy. And data-driven businesses are rapidly redefining the role of a traditional finance professional. So professionals are regularly looking for opportunities to upskill, to reskill in an increasingly competitive talent marketplace. They want more flexibility, more learning opportunities, on-demand cloud-based education content to access anywhere, anytime, and importantly, on any device. Professionals will need to become lifelong learners with the ability to learn, unlearn, and relearn new skills throughout their career. We're seeing more and more the need to have hybrid skills, a mix of traditional technical capabilities, such as budgeting and forecasting, and importantly, the non-technical capabilities, as uh, Professor Ho Yi has outlined beautifully before, such as innovation, communication, and emotional intelligence. So equally, employers are wanting to ensure their employee skills are up to date, and they're looking for relevant courses that they can upskill in a very short amount of time to meet progressive and dynamic business needs. So the short of it there is that new ways of working will require professionals to continuously upskill throughout their career with just-in-time learning. So this, I believe, will become a real feature of professional education. If you click over to the next slide, please. Thank you. Thanks. So one of the increasingly popular solutions to solve this global skills shortage is the introduction of micro-credentials. They're also known as digital badges and digital certificates. So micro-credentials, as you can see, are a short, consumable, online, verifiable, flexible, very much skills-focused and appropriate to the changing job environment. They are short, sharp pieces of learning with assessment that can address technical and non-technical skills against a capability framework. Lower level technical skills, as we know, are no longer required by professionals. So I think we now must continuously improve proficiency to remain relevant and current in today's business environment. 
So skills should be recognised against a capability framework, providing portability of learning across various institutions and enable a recognised prior learning for assessments to award certifications. So for example, what you're seeing here on the screen is CPA Australia's very newly developed uh, finance and accounting capability framework. And what it covers here is a broad range of skills required for a leading finance and accounting professional. And I believe it's very much in line with Professor Ho Yu Ki's presentation, as you can see the full breadth from integrity, financial fluency, adaptive learner, such an important skill now into the future. Uh, digital, data and digital, as, as you mentioned, um, some of those are the most important skills that finance professionals now need business professional and the all important leadership and self leadership skills. So a current challenge, I guess, with graduates leaving universities is they all have similar or the same degrees. And so what this means is they're not able to easily differentiate or market their skills um, easily. So by having defined skills based credentials, professionals are able to build what we call a skills portfolio, providing them the opportunity to really stand out in the crowd. It won't matter really where you start or where you come from in the future, the move will be to continuously develop your skills portfolio and your capability. And of course, we're seeing that now through LinkedIn and so many different media channels that you're able to, to build your personal brand and really become quite marketable. So therefore, I believe in short that micro credentials will certainly be the future of professional education. Uh, they, they offer all the benefits that I've outlined very quickly. Um, and I do believe that they will now currently and into the future change universities and also professional learning institutions such as CPA Australia and CMA. Uh, and uh, I think it'll be a very interesting road to watch. So thank you. Thank you very much, Loretta. And uh, next I would like to invite Mariam Reza to provide uh, an insight from her perspective in terms of intergenerational relationships to education. Mariam, over to you. Thank you for that, Lakpika. And uh, thank you for having me as well, um, for um, all of you as well. So what's interesting is Waddle Child works quite a bit with the intergenerational space around trying to understand how, how different generations consume, how different generations think and assume and uh, and perhaps even react as consumers and, cons and, and as workforce as well. And one of the things that we've, did, we've come up with is, it really falls down to when you look at your students, ultimately we look at them as consumers, as how do you consume education from a higher education and professional education point of view. And it comes to the four fundamental points, the Parker model, which is personalization, uh, ad advocacy, credibility and ownership. And I'll be happy to walk you through that as well. And I'll quickly just probably share a few slides as well, uh, if that's all right. Sure, please go ahead. It's not a problem. Let me just bear with me while I set this up. There we go. And there we go. Yep. So when you're talking about personalization, it fundamentally comes down to learning. And I am going to echo Loretta's statements around lifelong learning. And what we're beginning to see with the next generation of students to, to also uh, quote Professor Ho's uh, learning model, no, no longer are we looking at a peer, pillar structure, but we're looking at more of a T type structure where lifelong learning is you equip the student to learn from the cradle to the grave as, an, as the normal statement speaks to. And so therefore, not, not, they're not expecting you to be able to personalize their learning experience to their own individual needs, but they're looking at taking ownership of their learning experience and being able to seek out different providers to provide them the, the skill repertoire to be able to face the challenges of the future. So they're looking at different providers and they're looking at different components. So almost, almost like micro-credentialing to be able to um, assess or uh, equip themselves better for the workforce of the future. The second aspect is advocacy, which revolves around lifestyle. So when they choose a provider, they're looking at the lifestyle behind that provider. They're looking at the provider itself and they want to see social responsibility in, in the providers that they learn from. So when you look at learning, it's not necessarily only the content and consumption of the content that uh, makes students attracted to a certain type of course or a qualification, but they're also looking beyond that way and looking at what the organization is providing to them and providing to society. And when you look at advocacy, you do have a lot of um, consideration around the care factor. How well am I being looked after by the education? So therefore it's not just the education itself, but also the holistic um, experience, so to speak, that you're able to provide to these students. 
the third aspect is credibility. And we already know credibility ranks really highly for education. We want to be educated by the right providers, by the right names. Uh, but so naturally, safety, quality, and progression comes into play. So safety, when they provide, when they go to a provider, they expect that provider to provide a safe space. And this is more so pre predominantly more applicable, I would say, to the higher education sector than the, than the personal education sector, because the higher education sector is sort of the on-campus learning where you go to campus, you engage with the content, and therefore your safety is paramount. About 80% actually choose safe universities or safe locations, which is why Australia, uh, the UK and the US are ranked quite highly in, in um, education magnets. Quality obviously is based on ranking and uh, social proof. This is where students come to places that they, uh, their peers recommend. But what's interesting is their peers are slightly different as well based on the reference power. They look to recommendations by family and friends, but that is obviously dependent on the media and so therefore the rhetoric by governments and so on and so forth. And the next generation are very apt at consuming media to be able to make better informed decisions. The last one is obviously ownership. And this is interesting. Ownership is around affordability and lifestyle. So it's about being able to afford the level of education they have, but also have ownership in terms of the process. So they don't no longer, which is interesting in the new age, if you're looking at the new age of education, they don't necessarily want uh, a structured course sort of presented to them and saying that's inflexible. They do want to be able to choose the components that they want to be able to study. Therefore, again, reiterating what Loretta mentioned around micro-credentialing and obviously uh, the just-in-time learning uh, um, uh, concept that she just mentioned, which I love the word, is amazing. So that, that speaks to the general trend of uh, the next generation of students as well. So personalization, lifelong learning, advocacy, credibility, and obviously ownership as well. Thank you, Lakhika. Thank you very much, Miriam. So that's a bit of a takeaway for me, a PACO framework. Thank you very much for that. So uh, next I'd like to ask uh, Professor Paul Mather to give us his insights in terms of the next economy and education. Paul, over to you. Uh, thanks, Lakhmika. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, although it's night time for me, and uh, I've just got a couple of uh, slides to share, which I'll talk through quickly. Um, th the focus of my talk is, uh, or my couple of minutes is really to emphasize the fact that uh, as a result of the changing economic and business landscape, there are significant opportunities for us as educators. Uh, and that's partly through what people are now referring to as the COVID-19 next normal, uh, but partly uh, through um, various things that UQ, UQ was sort of uh, very eloquently articulating uh, about various digital skills and other skills that we've recognized for many years as being a requirement for the fourth industrial revolution, which has actually accelerated uh, during this period. Uh, as a simplistic example, um, uh, just, uh, just an interesting stat, uh, it won't surprise anyone that there were about 10 million participants in Zoom conversations in December, uh, uh, we're now looking at 300 million uh, or so per day. Uh, so it's quite an ex exponential change, but it's not just about Zoom, which is fairly obvious. It's about process automation. It's about the fact that most businesses have gone paperless uh, and so on. Um, I guess one of the things that probably got picked up in the previous session, but that's worth reiterating, is that what economic history has shown is that whenever there's a big exogenous shock like the one we've had uh, recently, and we're still under, undergoing, I guess, um, there tends to be significant shifts in customer and other stakeholder preferences that's gonna change the economic environment moving forward. And the critical thing is these preferences will typically stick uh, and will hold moving forward. A, a, a very simple example from my personal life. If you told me back in March that I'd be doing four yoga sessions or classes a week, I would have laughed at you. And if you told me that I'd be doing it online, uh, I, would have been, I would have thought that you were on something. Uh, the reality is I'm doing it and it's so efficient, so easy, so time efficient generally, I never plan to go back to a yoga studio ever again. 
Um, so uh, what sort of things could happen? Um, so this is slightly in an Australian context, but I suspect uh, it's probably true to a large degree across the globe. Um, we're, we're already seeing shifts to contactless commerce, uh, questioning the resilience and diversity of supply chains and a push for more local manufacturing, reassessing just-in-time inventory policies, uh, shifting to working from uh, home, and again, some of it's going to stick, and that's going to have big implications uh, uh, around sort of um, uh, infrastructure planning and so on. And certainly in Australia, we're, we're seeing a trend towards migration to the regions because people have suddenly realized that uh, they can have a great lifestyle and work remotely. Uh, but also, as I said earlier, one of the things we're also seeing is a lot of the trends we were talking about in the context of the fourth industrial revolution are actually accelerating rapidly. Um, what this does is, I believe, present great opportunities for the higher education sector, uh, partly uh, to do the sort of thing that Yuki was talking about in terms of fairly urgently, and this is pretty urgent, um, <clears throat> build in uh, digital skills and digitization into our curriculums uh, uh, across the business spectrum, and I'd argue not just the business spectrum, uh, but also I think there's a challenge to be able to identify these shifts, those more macro shifts that are happening, and make, sh make sure that taking the higher education sector as a whole, not necessarily just business schools, that we are uh, having the right products in place, uh, you know, degrees, subjects, and so on, to actually deal with these shifts. Uh, and this is going to be fairly dynamic and moving fast, and uh, the, 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 the uh, uh, micro-credentials that Loretta was talking about will be part of the solution uh, because it's actually quite agile and allows you to make those shifts fairly quickly. Um, just a couple of other things in terms of the next normal. I'm not going to talk about content, skills, student experience, bar for one thing which I'm going to finish off with because I know a couple of, a lot of the some of the panelists are going to be talking about that, but I just want to pick up on a few other things. Uh, and that is to say, um, I think one of the things that's hit us certainly in Australia is that uh, there is an imperative around having more business school research shifting from pure research to uh, research which has demonstrable sort of impact. Uh, and there's various reasons for that, partly uh, universities are short of cash, uh, and you're more likely to get funding from business and external organizations if the research has impact. Uh, but I think a wider issue that has certainly happened in Australia is that it's clear that the federal government uh, isn't a great fan of universities at this moment in time, certainly in terms of funding uh, and support during COVID. Uh, and uh, I think there's been a recognition within universities that we need to do more to demonstrate the value of uh, the value proposition associated with higher education beyond just turning out graduates with degrees. Um, linked with that, again, uh, many business schools around the world, and ours was no exception, have um, uh, seen the need for increased community engagement uh, and putting back uh, during this period, and I suspect that is going to remain. So for example, my business school, within about a week of Melbourne starting to get locked down, put out what we call the Leaders in Lockdown MOOC style six module program, which was free, uh, which we put out to all our partner organizations where their employers, for employers who are being stepped down, uh, stood down uh, or uh, had been made redundant. So it was like a service to help them upskill, but it also had modules from Mercer and so on to, for them to rethink. Uh, how they see their career going and so on. And I did a module in that on crisis management. Uh, but again, it was a free service and we've had about 11,000 people go through that uh, uh, module so far. Um, the other implication, I think, for universities is the whole area around being agile. Uh, I was talking about the fact that the situation is very dynamic. 
and things are accelerating. And uh, I think, again, Yuki very diplomatically alluded to that, I'll be less so. Uh, universities are hopelessly slow uh, at uh, moving, producing new degrees, getting rid of old degrees, shifting. Uh, and that we've got to find ways to change uh, because uh, that's not going to work well the way the world is going. Uh, and I think the final thing I'd say in the context of the next normal is uh, around leadership models that we've really got to universities outside the US, by and large, it's an academic who's the head of department, then a dean and so on, and they become vice chancellors. Uh, and you sometimes wonder they're very bright people with a lot of discipline knowledge, but are they uh, the right people to manage and provide leadership uh, of uh, organizations that are going through significant change and having to deal with an economy or economies that are going through significant change. So we need to really look at those leadership models. Um, and same could be said for professional organizations. Um, typically, it's a service, um, uh, service role that's performed by a council and so on. Uh, now, they're very capable people and they've probably got business skills, certainly in the accounting field, uh, but you know, the time constraints and so on. So that balance between having people strongly embedded in the profession versus people with strong leadership skills with the time to invest in the organization, you know, that whole model really needs, is worth revisiting. I just want to finish off with something slightly out of left field. Uh, and I say this kind of for a reason. Uh, I totally agree with Yuki's analysis about the soft transferable skills, the digital skills, uh, and the need to integrate uh, and, and so on. And you know, we've been talking about that for a, a few years now. Um, but one of the things I want to also talk about, both from a leadership point of view, but also in terms of how we teach and educate our students, is about the need to think outside the silo. And this crisis sort of really laid it on the line for me. Because people keep talking about the fact that it's unprecedented, there's no playbook for this crisis, and so on. And yet, if you think outside our business silo, going back to the Prussian War, and this is a standard text in uh, all good military academies, you know, West Point and so on, you know, one Clausewitz talks about the fact that it is impossible to plan military campaigns because there's so many dynamic parts that change. That military leaders must be able to make decisions under extreme time pressure with incomplete information, with things moving, uh, and so on, uh, which has really, uh, and I've oversimplified here, but a strong parallels to the sort of things businesses were encountering when the pandemic hit. And then he also goes on to talk about some deeper principles and solutions to kind of deal with. And indeed, a couple of businesses in Australia and our large organizations uh, were talking with ex-military people uh, in order to help them navigate, uh, particularly the first uh, couple of months of the crisis. Um, and a big, big limitation we have uh, in our uh, university system and even our professional educational systems is that we teach people within silos. And I always tell my students, accountings, when you go out in the real world, you don't have just accounting problems, they're really business problems, and you need to be able to think across business disciplines, but it actually goes beyond that. Uh, and that is something I think we need to think about uh, with all this as well, because I'd hate to see a situation where uh, what Yuki laid out comes true, we, we embed all these digital skills, et cetera, but people are still thinking through those silos when in fact, what business needs and employers constantly tell us is people who are able to think cross-functionally uh, and uh, outside the silos. Uh, and I think I'm gonna leave it there. Thank you very much, uh, Professor May. That, uh, that was very insightful. I really like the part about the uh, concept of, you know, uh, thinking outside silos. So that goes to where I'm a big proponent of the concept of integrated thinking, where you actually go beyond the individual silos and you look at it as, as a holistic uh, approach. So uh, in saying that, uh, I have Manil Jayasinghe, the president of CA Sri Lanka, from a professional, one of the two professional body perspectives from Sri Lanka, Manil, uh, what are your perspectives 
in relation to uh, the new normal or the next uh, the new normal in the next economy in terms of professional education uh, from a CA perspective and also maybe extending it back to the Asia Pacific region as well. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Lakpika, and uh, thank you for CMA for inviting me. Uh, I think what I was going to say, most of it has been covered by Professor Ho and now just now uh, uh, Professor Mather. Uh, but just to touch on some of the things that I feel uh, that are important, uh, actually the, the, the transformation in professional education uh, didn't start uh, with COVID, but it started some time back, probably with the fourth uh, industrial uh, revolution. Uh, COVID, of course, has made it uh, accelerate the pace in which transformation in education will take place. Uh, I think, uh, as Professor Ho mentioned, one of the key things that uh, educators or professional education today needs to grapple is this whole balance between uh, technical knowledge and skills. Uh, many of our uh, many of our curriculum tends to focus a lot, I believe, on technical knowledge, and probably uh, don't really uh, interest too much of the skills part of it. Uh, just to share with you, uh, in Sri Lanka, they have done a study uh, called the, uh, the, the Stresser study and they have found that much of the skills that employers look for are things like communication skills, uh, team working skills, uh, uh, ability to adapt and act on in new situations. So some of these skills are the things that uh, the, the employers are, are looking at. And if you look at, uh, so therefore, if you look at uh, what future curriculum should look like, uh, one has to look at to see whether, you know, one of the things that kept on coming uh, with the, the previous speakers as well is this whole equation about agility and adaptability. How fast can one adapt uh, to change in circumstances and situations and how agile are you? Then commercial awareness. Uh, and, and I think Professor Ho mentioned this whole equation about uh, complex problem solving, uh, critical decision making, uh, that whole skills part of it. Uh, then, then comes interpersonal skills like, uh, say for example, interpersonal skills, confidence, self-awareness and time management. Uh, then we have leadership and ability to work under pressure. And we have this whole equation of emotional intelligence. So th these are all uh, skills that uh, employers are looking at of a, of a, of a professional. Uh, so in the past, we had this scenario where we believed uh, we needed to sort of equip ourselves with a lot of knowledge and probably not necessarily equip ourselves with all these skills that are uh, being looked at. So. If you, if you look at some of the studies that have been done again, you will see that we are looking at skills such as analytical and problem solving skills, uh, good reading, decision making, language, communication skills. So th these are all things that people are looking for. And this was not, not really brought upon by COVID, but it was uh, out there, which, was, which, was, uh, which needed to be addressed and many, many people uh, many professional institutions are, I think, in, in, in many ways trying to address this. So that is from a, uh, how should I say, skills and knowledge point of view. Then we come to the next part, which is really, uh, uh, which is really the, uh, the delivery of these things. I think Professor Mehta uh, touched on this also to say that, uh, you know, earlier he used to do four four classes or lectures or whatever you may call it and today he's doing it at from from a different location but he's delivering this through uh, electronic uh, media so clearly going forward the higher education will combine a mixture of uh, in-person location-based programs ex uh, experimental teaching and the flexibility of both uh, synchronized and uh, synchronized virtual learning so these are things that will happen uh, so with that, if you look at it, uh, if you look, okay, the, the, you'll have to address the curriculums, which probably needs to get free, uh, future proof. Then you need to look at the delivery mechanisms, how these are being uh, delivered. And those are going to take a huge change 
taking uh, into account what is happening today. Uh, these changes were coming, but I think COVID has accelerated in a tremendous form these changes. For example, uh, University of Cambridge and other they recently announced that all their lectures will be available online, which I'm sure uh, six months ago or one year ago, one would have uh, not thought it uh, possible or practical to, to uh, go down that road. Then we have uh, the, the, the last piece in the equation is the assessment part. You know, you can have a good curriculum, uh, you can have uh, all these uh, uh, delivery mechanisms which are basically embracing today's technology and, and uh, new thinking, but you also need to then uh, update and change the process of assessment as to how a student can be assessed whether the necessary competencies have been uh, achieved or uh, obtained. So once again, <coughs> these assessment processes, uh, to recently we had a situation where now, as you know, Sri Lanka, we, we are now facing probably the next wave. Uh, we had our examinations which was scheduled to be done and now it has to be postponed again. So you cannot continuously do this. So we need to find a different, different ways of uh, doing assessments. Many people have gone online, uh, but then there are other challenges. But nevertheless, going forward, I think uh, it's going to, you, you, you are going to have a large extent of the assessments also being uh, remotely uh, uh, sort of um, remotely delivered. So just to, just to uh, uh, sort of leave with uh, the last uh, thoughts, as I mentioned earlier, the, the skills that the markets are requiring are probably not the skills that the educators are really giving to the students. Uh, if you look at studies done in the US, well studies done even in Sri Lanka, they are talking about, bulk of it is talking about skills. Knowledge is part of it. So one of the things that you will have to do is uh, probably uh, give some foundational knowledge but equip the students with the necessary skills to, to which, which the markets are really asking. Uh, so for example, like as I keep mentioning this problem solving, critical thinking, innovation and creativity, ability to deal with complexity and ambiguity and communication. So these are some of the critical skills that has to be embodied in these study programs so that, uh, so that the, these students become uh, competent. Uh, another area that, that probably needs to be addressed is uh, today's millennials and today's students don't want necessarily to have a four-year course or a five-year course or a six-year course for them to qualify as uh, competent uh, professionals. They're looking at uh, very short-term uh, courses. So given that, that will also have to be factored in. But on the other side, you have to also acknowledge that some of the professions that uh, deliver their output uh, require a lot of experience that needs to be gathered over the period in order to deliver what the markets want. So this also will have to be taken factored into uh, the education programs going forward. So as I mentioned to you, uh, I'm not bringing anything new as such. I think Professor Ho, Professor Mehta, uh, I think Mariam, all these people covered uh, what this new, new, uh, new normal is going to look like. The new normal was not something that was not there or we didn't know about. I think all of us knew about all these things. It's just that this whole pandemic is really accelerating our journey towards what we should have been achieving uh, in the past. Uh, so with that, I will uh, stop, uh, Lakmi. Thank you very much, Manu. That's very insightful. So uh, let's. It's, it's interesting to look at it from uh, a professional body perspective, but now I would like to in introduce and uh, welcome uh, Professor Chandra Abuldenia uh, for us to get a perspective from an ad a senior administrator's point of view. I mean, he's been a vice chancellor of one of the entrepreneurial universities, the first entrepreneurial university the founding vice chancellor of the Entrepreneurial University in Sri Lanka. So from that perspective, uh, Professor Ambuldenia, what are your thoughts in terms of higher education and the next economy from an administrator's point of view? Thank you, Lakmika, and thank you, Lakman, for inviting me. Uh, actually, I'm very happy listening to all the speakers that I've got uh, as every 
thing that they been uh, telling us here included in the past 15 years of development of the university uh, that uh, universities that I have been working on. In the first place, I totally agree uh, on the uh, on what we heard from uh, 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 Paul uh, about the value proposition and the change of the curriculum that we really need and differentiating and also breaking down the silos. And actually that is where I started. I started breaking down the silos and you know, we worked without a silo system. And then we also integrated our uh, knowledge uh, in, a, in, in many multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary programs. Now, uh, in the systems that we are operating with the uh, with FOIR, this is something that we can do very uh, effectively. Uh, instead of uh, resorting to the factory model that we have been doing over the years, in the sense the industrial revolution gave us the factories, and today we are going to robotics and all the artificial intelligence and all the digitalization and all that. But the point is, we still continue to run our universities in the uh, factory oriented, uh, the industrial revolution. Uh, I've seen it here as well as overseas. But today, uh, Lakmika, we really need to switch our education to uh, an online mode of uh, learning. So you can call it uh, online, you can call it anything that is taking you away from the classroom that is the brick and mortar to uh, wherever you want to be and learn from that location and then come back to the classroom to uh, get the uh, experience in the classroom with the rest of the people socializing and also getting the teacher's experience integrated into your head. Now, in this respect, I want to remind you that, you know, in professional education, uh, the accountancy aspect is one, but then there are the two major ends that we are all uh, used to in the factory model. That is one is the production of the doctors and the other one is the production of the engineers. Now, these are all guaranteed jobs in the market, but people who are in the middle, uh, that is uh, from the science streams and the art streams, uh, humanities and all those people are really, students really are lost in the search for their jobs. They are the people who have been most affected. Now, how do we uh, really build the set of skills that really we need to impart uh, in our uh, process? And through the curriculum itself, they should not be taught in you know, in isolation in, uh, as a different subject, because most people seem to think that communication is a skill that we have to teach the students. Now, in my uh, uh, TOR to the lecturers uh, who are doing communication, I told them you have to develop the curricula as uh, a skill that is that people sh should uh, start uh, practicing rather than, you know, uh, you know, it's a, a theoretical subject. Now we started doing this process in 2004 in our country and then gradually uh, developed it uh, to a much uh, uh, effective means of uh, giving the skills to the students. So what should happen really is all the students, everyone who is coming from a university should be a person who is acceptable to somebody somewhere in the employment uh, same. I mean, basically a company should be able to pay for that uh, person's uh, ability to work with the company's uh, value chain. So where does he fit into a value chain in a company? Now, my best explanation for that is actually keep your education STEAM oriented. That is science, technology, engineering, aesthetics, and mathematics. There is no point in our having accountants without the awareness of what is happening and why they are uh, needed as accountants in our companies. You see, the accountants are needed in the companies for number crunching and then producing information. 
But I think the accountant's role must go beyond that. For example, our Professor Ho mentioned uh, the, 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 the power of uh, big data and analytics. You know, I'm also, uh, I mean, you, you, Lakmika, you, you, you brought it out actually, I'm also the chairman of the committee for setting up a sport, National Sports University. And you see one of the guys whom I'm working with, he showed me the power of big data in sports. You see, that is amazing how they really track the movements of all the athletes on the uh, ground. And for example, basketball, how uh, these basketball players are moving, moving on the, and thousands and thousands of uh, data uh, modules have been, you know, brought together and put together to see and track and give that information instantly to the players on the, uh, on the, on the, on the courts. So, uh, and it's amazing to see, you know, how effective, how efficient, how productive these players become on the uh, screen. So now if the accountant is also using big data and also he should also be aware of the, the environment in which he, he need, is needed to produce that data. In, this, in, in other words, he should be really uh, very much in line with the thinking of the company on the production side. What are the inputs that are going in? Where, where is the manufacturing taking place? How is the, what is the process? I mean, what are the scientific components in this sport? What is the chemistry? What is the physics? What is the engineering? Now, most of the accountants in our country, I mean, I'm not telling uh, this in a bad sense. I have seen these accountants all over the world, but the point is they are all silo-based thinkers. At least for 15 years in their life, in their career, they're silo-based thinkers. So basically you need to break away the accountants from the silo-based thinking to a very integrated mindset based on the STEAM education. So as Professor Ho and also, uh, uh, I, I forget who mentioned it uh, later, they should really take them to the next level of learning uh, in the curriculum itself. And also through the practical experiences they get, you might say that, you know, we get plenty of case studies to uh, uh, work on so that our uh, thinking uh, becomes uh, uh, transformational. But the point is uh, to get the mindset uh, particularly away from the piece of paper and the com computer, you need to really have the practical experience. Now that I come to the situation today for the next economy, that is today, uh, I think most of our universities in Sri Lanka really have transformed onto online uh, way of uh, using different platforms. So basically they are all giving their lessons uh, on the, uh, t uh, on, uh, on, uh, online. But there is this aspect that you cannot bring online even with artificial intelligence. That is bringing uh, the laboratory experiences, the workshop experiences, and then the, uh, you know, the socializing aspect. So they're all, uh, you know, at home and uh, trying to work uh, their lessons and also submitting some of the assessments online for processing. But we really need to uh, really get better at, uh, 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 at uh, giving this learning experience to students, uh, remembering that what students perceive are from the five sensory basis that we have in our body. You see, we have the, 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 the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, and the contact from the body. These are the five sensory bases that we really get information into our head. And then we take this information in our brain and then process it, and then we produce the outcomes. And that is how, how best you can really, how fast you can process that in your brain is what really makes you the better person, better decision maker, better leader. So all these skills really have to be connected to that point. Think about this, what I'm saying. You see, now when we bring the computer in, we replace some part of that activity to uh, transform the drudgery of doing things to the computer. That is why we are doing big data and all that, getting all this information into the thing. So we have to really connect the big data outcomes also to this uh, sensory, perceptions to get the best decision makers into uh, in our learning process. 
Now, this is only a point that I'm making for you to think, uh, you know, as you uh, start working on uh, education reforms to suit the next economy. Our next economy, the bigger problems today are introducing food for the world, getting rid of poverty, you know, and livelihoods. How do we really make, you know, the, the big data and artificial intelligence and the whole industrial revolution has created major problems all over the world for uh, generating income for people. And that, I think, you know, if you look at the data, uh, I've seen that, you know, we have more poor people uh, than uh, people who have become, uh, you know, uh, middle income. That uh, even, uh, you know, we have produced many billionaires in the world, but uh, more poor people. So we really need to think about it. And then how do we really uh, make a sustainable economy through big data, through artificial intelligence, through robotics and all that to support the large majority of people in the world, how, how we can support them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Amul Denny. That was very insightful in terms of an administrator's point of view. Uh, I would like to now invite uh, Drew Cullen to talk about it from uh, a public sector perspective and to bring in that aspect of it into how we see education going into the next economy. Drew, over to you. I think you're on mute, Drew. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, 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 sorry, Drew, I think you're next. Well, Drew? Next. Thank you. Sorry, hold, yeah. Somebody had to do it. <laughs> um, thanks very much, Lukmika. Um, coming at the end, it's useful to hear all of the other comments that people have been making. I don't know whether the slides could go up or not. Uh, I don't mind if they don't, but I'll just run through that. Um, I think the thing to um, to really sort of put into context from a government and public service perspective is the obviously the you know absolute historic significance of the crisis that we're all going through, and uh, very particularly that that will obviously affect how governments are uh, funded and the things that they need to provide funding for in terms of public services, that's going to have repercussions for a very, very long time. Um, this is uh, touching not just uh, developed economies or um, economies in a particular sector, it's, it's touching all economies all the way around the world. Um, so that, that's going to be a very significant kind of readjustment for everybody to make going forward. I mean, if you look at the last hundred years, uh, the last few months have affected uh, more countries than any other previous uh, recession, um, including the obviously the, uh, the one about 10 years ago, 2008 uh, financial crash, and even the, uh, the, the recession of the early 90, late 1920s and early 30s. Um, and I think what, what the World Bank is saying is uh, that the future fiscal position is, is still unknown. Of course, we, you know, we're, we're feeling like we're entering into, certainly does here, um, a, a second wave that's having an impact. The, the, the airwaves are rammed with arguments between public service leaders and, and politicians around what the sort of support ought to be for for government uh, bodies at all levels of government. Um, and the uh, World Bank has it as two scenarios, as a kind of very, very bad one and an even worse one. So um, we're looking at something quite dramatic. And I think that that will obviously have an impact on the, the psychology of governments and um, the psychology of uh, populations and the, the people who are served by those public services. Um, in the um, government and public sector context, then this impact is uh, going to result in you know, on two results really: one, fewer resources uh, to spend, um, and uncertain future revenues, and then also rising demand. As uh, anybody who is listening to this session will have heard, um, we are in a period anyway 
of very significant rising levels of inequality in the world uh, and have been for some time. And I think some of the some of the coverage of the impact of COVID is that you know some of the very best off wealthiest people in the world have actually got very significantly more wealthy as a result of uh, COVID and obviously the most vulnerable in society have suffered some of the some of the worst uh, impacts. So uh, governments are going to be dealing with uh, a, a really difficult and toxic cocktail of um, lower revenues and higher demand from their populations. So I think that that, that drives, as many people have been saying, two responses. Um, in particular, um, the use of data and digital growth. We can see in all aspects of the economy, um, we can see in government's response to the COVID crisis, how uh, the di digital um, apps and so forth, uh, the tracking systems and everything have come into being very quickly. Uh, we're moving into new technologies very quickly to support, to support the, um, the, the, the impacts of, um, of COVID. Uh, both on a sort of medical level, but also at an economic level. Um, and reflecting that data and digital growth, which has been going on every, in any way and everybody has acknowledged in their presentations, uh, that's something that's obviously going to uh, rapidly accelerate. Um, it's going to have an impact on the way in which we work, uh, references to how many more people Zoom meetings like now. Um, and it's going to put pressure on governments to increase their efficiency. Um, I'm picking up what the last speaker was saying about how um, universities are still very in a uh, old industrial mood in terms of face-to-face -face and uh, bricks and mortar. Um, they, they're clearly having to operate in a very new way uh, in terms of delivering um, their teaching online, but ironically, to students who all have tended to gather in the same places and in the same um, sort of halls of residence and so forth. So not a lot has changed in terms of the way that people have engaged with it, but the way in which they're being taught is, is changing rapidly. So we, we will no doubt see um, a, a further acceleration of that in terms of people not really needing to go there. That may have some impacts on uh, social interactions and so forth, which I think is something that uh, we need to be mindful of online communities, online learning, um, meeting each other in virtual spaces like this is uh, all very well and highly desirable in circumstances like this, but there is still uh, an, a, an aspect of life uh, that we as humans still appreciate in terms of uh, personal contact and being in each other's company. And that encourages and fosters better learning as well. So. Um, it's something that we must be mindful of and not, not throw out. Um, another facet of the sort of increased uh, digitization and globalization uh, process, which is being accelerated by COVID, is um, the, the levels of and this is something that nobody's mentioned so far, so I'm pleased to come on with a new one. Um, levels of fraud, cyber threat, and the involvement of organized crime in our lives is uh, something that obviously is impacting hugely on governments and that's 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 got a knock-on effect for um sort of the lives of citizens the availability of resources to invest in in public services and developing the economy um so it's really really important uh that you know and this will point to ever increasing amounts of specialization amongst the accounting profession and those managing money on other people's behalf um, that they need to understand what those threats are, but also be able to investigate them and come up with preventative strategies for uh, maintaining uh, the security of uh, the resources that, that we have within our financial systems. So um, I think that that's going to be, uh, it's pointing to in a way illustrates just the, how very much more specialised uh, professions will become. And in fact, the, the professions that we know uh, as, as they stand may well you know, change over time and we'll see increasingly data specialists and so on who are going to be 
um, the, the, the roles and new roles for the future. Um, obviously, governments are uh, all, nearly all, signed up to the uh, UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals. And I think that the, the um, changes in attitudes in society at large are really quite significant as well in terms of how we shape curriculums going forward um, and uh, the people planet profit or in in public sector terms the balanced budget for a country or a public sector entity um, those are going to be sort of driving forces around um, what people learn uh, it's going to obviously um, Sort of impact on uh, what accountants do, how they do it, what they invest in, what they're reporting on, what they're monitoring, and so forth. So, I think that the, as it were, new generation um, and changes in societal thinking, accelerated by uh, global uh, sort of carbon neutral, carbon neutrality or sustainability, or or simply. Um, sort of reactions to things like uh, the rise in populism and so forth, I think will very definitely impact on what we're teaching people. Uh, in society, just finally, a sort of few things about future learners and their behaviors. Attention spans are falling very rapidly, an impact of uh, digitization and the fact that we're using our phones all the time, um, sort of average human um, attention span dropping from 12 seconds in the last 10 years to eight seconds, now lower than a goldfish, unbelievably. Um, so uh, going back to those sorts of issues around micro-credentialing and the sort of uh, bite-sized pieces of learning, that's obviously going to be something that's uh, of increasing attraction to people, uh, whether they're in public or, or other sectors. Um, same time, digital facility of Gen X um, is going to encourage uh, more of the same and uh, multiple use of uh, different platforms. And that will really be catapulted forward. I think I'd probably say one word uh, for in the difference in public sector is that historically, um, and I think even still now, uh, it tends to have older workers in it than does the corporate and private sector. Um, and that's that's a sort of a function of sort of perhaps attitudinal uh, issues where people are looking for more secure, longer term careers and less likely to move around. I think that 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 will clearly be changing, but it's a generational issue, and there are uh, there is a sort of legacy drag in the public sector workforce which needs um, needs to be helped and supported. Um, in terms of uh, new, new ways of learning. Um, and that won't necessarily come easy to uh, a lot of people. Um, on the um, attachment to old ways of doing things, yes, flexibility um, in how we work, uh, where, people, uh, where people work. Another dynamic of COVID is, um, and, and very particularly amongst the government bodies that, that we work with, is that, you know, I'm having conversations with people who are working from home, not their council offices or their hospital hospital uh, facilities and so forth. And um, what one of the responses that government will necessarily have to make is reappraising how it uses its assets. So, um, you know, where it can trim those down and uh, work more virtually, which is clearly demonstrating it can do in the current circumstances, it's going to need to do uh, in terms of you know how it how it approaches um, sort of uh, its asset portfolio in the future, and that will mean lead to more remote learning, more online communities, virtual networks of workers, and you know the support that we as uh, accounting professional bodies and others are able to give people will necessarily need to fit that mould rather than supporting people in small mm -hmm. cohorts of learners coming out of one particular yeah. workplace or going into it. So I think I'll probably stop there, Lukmika. Um, Thank you but, very uh, much. Hopefully that will give a bit of insight. Yes, that was that was absolutely fantastic from a, a public sector perspective, because I think that's one of the areas that we don't look at as, as much as often as we should be looked at. We, we always 
tend to look at it from a business perspective as opposed to the public perspective. So it, it is wonderful mm. to get that view. Last but not least, we have Professor Ali uh, Khatibi. Uh, thank you, Professor, for joining us. And, you know, uh, in terms of your experience from uh, an administrator in a, in a university in the Asia Pacific region, uh, how do you see uh, the future affecting the stu from a student's perspective. I think that is more relevant to some of the participants here who are lifelong learners, who are students. How does it affect them in terms of going forward post-COVID and possibly into the new future? All right, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, all right, let's uh, the, uh, give a little bit background where we are now today. Back to 1997, I was involved with the project in Tokyo, the Toshiba development of interactive classroom. Because we done the research with the Toshiba in Tokyo, and we find that in 2025, the education mode is going to be changed. And it's going to be online, all right? And those days we were talking about interactive. I don't like to call it online because online is a very traditional way of mindset. And we developed it very good. And we were doing at the postgraduate level. At 2014, we have started to put some of our courses online for the people to try free of charge, subject by subject. And after that, many universities started to do that. And everybody was looking forward. By 2025, many universities they are not going to be physical anymore. Is going to be virtual. And we are start to move there. And uh, it was a successful project. And uh, we were looking to what uh, other colleagues, especially Prof. Who was mentioning what they do in Singapore. And we are start with a lot of soft skill, building the character, especially building the good attitude. The future generation, how to respond to that. And two years ago, we find that is, yes, communication is good, attitude can be good, but technology part needs to be better. So we add some more curriculum, like uh, uh, more on the big data and so on to our soft skill. And to encourage the generation to accept that as important, in my university, we give two transcripts. One is the academic transcript, one is a soft skill transcript to prove that the student they have gone through that. Thing. And three years ago, we come up with a very interesting things because we know that future is changing. And we start to move something like a digital community, community services, digital run, digital uh, activities. And it was very interesting seeing that other students, they can be in Sri Lanka, other countries, in Malaysia, in different states, they can come together and they do something together and removing the location barriers. And uh, thanks to, normally I don't look to COVID-19 as a crisis, I look as opportunities because what we are supposed to do after 2025 is happening now. But the biggest challenges for any higher education is how we respond to the changes. I have seen in many universities, what they will do more online is just putting the PowerPoint and just keeping it, giving the talk. They are not very interactive. And social interaction with the student will come with the interactive learning not one way to learn. And what we find that how we need to do changes, all right, and uh, what we are sought to do is changing our teaching mode. Rather than to be a one way lecture, we start to talk about 21st century learning. A student, they need to be interactive together. A student, they need to discuss together. A student, they need to do presentation is not only one way ticket. And the result, what we find that is, a student, they enjoy the teaching. 
what was in the traditional classroom, we move it to the interactive learning, not online learning, more interactive. So a student are active in the class. And uh, I believe that uh, with the modern technology today, for example, when I teach it, and I want the student to give the feedback, a student, they can see the, each other feedback on the screen and they can comment to each other and they become mm -hmm. more and more interested. Why we do this? Because the future industries, they are not looking for certificate anymore. They are looking for the very good character with the, with the special skills. And how we develop this, all right, we start to build up in the every other curriculum. And um, we started our interactive learning at my universities about four years ago. 50% of the other courses was interactive. And the good part is all of the lecturers that are trained. With my experience in Sri Lanka, what I feel Sri Lanka University need to do is to train the academician of how to build up the online, because in Sri Lanka you call online, online learning. Because in my university, what we do is every year we have a training on the modern technology, modern teaching method, and we make sure that all of our academicians are updated with the skills needed with the industries and how to engage with other students. Because what we mm -hmm. see on coronavirus is not going to finish very early, all right? We are looking forward to have this virus with us another one or two years. And it will That's be true. on and off. I believe that again in Sri Lanka, again, you have been to lockdown. <coughs> we went to lockdown from tomorrow morning, all right? This is going to be on not only in Asia, in Australia, everywhere we are going to face this. But question is, we cannot just ignore the future. We need to make Thank sure you. that other students, they prepare themselves, all right, to respond. We have started to do it year ago, before this coming up, how to do the uh, online internship. Some of my students are doing the internship in Australia, Singapore, Taiwan, South Korea, all right. They are in Malaysia, but internship done in the different countries because we were looking forward, this is going to be a future. And that is a challenge which many universities, they need to start to plan from today, all right, for the future. And we believe as strongly as NSU, by 2025, many universities that are going to be online. All right, that's going to be a future. Back to you. Thank you very much, Prof. That's a very interesting viewpoint because, and that goes to my next question to the panel. Um, this question is going to Professor Ho and also Professor Meta, as well as you, uh, Professor Ali. In terms of universities, do you see the universities surviving in its current form in the next two to five years. The reason for my question is this. You can see many of the top universities, top tier Ivy League universities, top 10, top 15 universities in the world going global with these cloud-based education systems, interactive cloud-based cloud education systems. So in that sense, anybody in the world now can actually enroll at a very low cost to a, a course in Harvard or Cambridge or Oxford or uh, you know uh, any of the Ivy League universities. So where in this kind of scenario are there opportunities for universities as well as professional bodies? I mean, there is a chance that you know the top tier, the top end of town might get into the professional sector as well. So how do you see the competitive advantages and how the universities uh, in our side of town going to adapt to this kind of scenario in going forward? Uh, we, we can start with Professor Ho and then move to Professor Paul and then uh, the others can join in as well as uh, Professor Ali as well as Professor Ambul Denia. Uh, thank you very much. I would like to believe that uh, as an educator, I will probably be uh, never be replaced by a machine. You are absolutely right. The online learning is uh, available. But I think it, human being a social, social creature would also like interaction, face-to-face -face interaction as it is. Yeah. So 
I was think that the university will survive. Uh, the lecturers and the instructors will have to change. You see, I, I tell my faculty this, right? Uh, if you are not able to add value to your students, right, or you are only conducting a lecture as a monologue, I'm reasonably certain that the student can get a same a video on the same topic in the internet in which if it's a male instructor, it will be more handsome, or if it's a lady, it will be prettier as it is. Yeah. So then what is your value proposition? And this is where I coined a term called edutainment, right? As an educator, we stand in the class, we provide entertainment, but that kind of entertainment has life-changing uh, impact because we convey information, knowledge, face-to-face, -face, interaction, consultancy, is I mean, right? Facilitation, as if in entertaining the student, they learn and they will always want to come back again and again and again. Thank so you very much, Rob. It raises yeah. teaching to a different level as it is altogether. That's a very interesting point. Is there anything else you want to add, uh, Professor Mather? <laughs> you're mute. Uh, Mather, you're mute, yes. Yeah, correct. Thanks, Yuki. Um, yeah, look, this isn't a new phenomenon because the threat of MOOCs, etc., has been around. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things I used to tell my faculty in a previous leadership role is unless you can provide students with a reason to come to university, give them the word I used to use as an experience, um, they're not going to bother. Uh, the, the phenomenon you're describing is kind of going to happen. And um, so it's some of the things that Yuki talked about. It's some of the things that particularly with some of these transferable skills, I think having students in a classroom, a physical environment can actually enhance your ability to develop those skills. It's not that you can't do it online. I think it is easier to do it face-to-face, -face, you know, whether it's a negotiation or yeah. uh, some group dynamic stuff or, you know, whatever it is. Uh, but the other thing is, is a mindset. So for example, um, you can be locally adaptive. Uh, I was teaching an MBA class uh, in the first half of this year. Mm -hmm. uh, and one class was the day after Virgin Australia announced they were going into um, receivership. And we turned half the class spontaneously into an analysis of Virgin's finances. Now, I think it's going to be very difficult for uh, even you know, much broader academics at Harvard or whatever to be able to be that adaptive yeah. uh, to a local audience uh, in real time. That's an interesting viewpoint because that's absolutely right. So taking regional issues and dealing it in, in that sense. So uh, uh, my next question is to Miriam and Loretta. Uh, from your perspectives, we have the, uh, the new generation, the, the ones I call the click generation or the swipe generation. So uh, these are the people who are going through some of the programs at the moment. And in, in your view, uh, what do you think the viewpoints of qualifications and credentials are going to be for the next generation in terms of academic qualifications versus professional qualifications? So there's a differentiation here. And most of you have done both of, both of the different types of qualifications. So what are the viewpoints from uh, the, the click generation or the swipe generation of the value of these different types of qualifications from your view? We'll start off with Miriam and then move to Loretta. Thank you for that, Lakhmika. Great question. I think it's interesting. I think we're beginning to see the merging of what these two different industries are. Ultimately, it's just education. And from, from the next generation's point of view, they're very pragmatic. They're very, to quote Bandura's principle of self-efficacy, they already know what they want to do. So they will seek out education as it is, which is why modular education is good. And so therefore, I would see the, the two industries converge, so, so to speak, and compete on the same level playing field for the same components of education to equip individuals across their, the course of their life effectively. Uh, yes, Loretta, uh, over to you. 
I would absolutely agree um, with you in terms of the the generation, as, as I think has been mentioned on the call with the low concentration span, um, I think people are generally a bit more impatient. They're uh, wanting a result a lot quicker. So I think where micro credentials is quite appealing is around that short, sharp learning and uh, you know really getting on with it. They know what skill they are looking for. They're quite savvy in terms of their career and they know where they wanna go. Uh, and they're looking to get there as fast as they possibly can. So I think appealing to them is to have a wide range of content that's very immersive and engaging and interactive, as been said before, so that they can really get to their goal very quickly. Um, and, and as I said, create that skills portfolio that's very marketable um, so that they can, uh, you know, post it all over the internet and, uh, you know, improve their personal brand. So I think that's, that's key for them. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, in terms of uh, or going into cloud education, I think Professor Ali talked about moving to this, this uh, misconception of cloud and uh, online. But uh, Professor Ali, very quickly, if you can tell us, is there a way of introducing experiential learning into this cloud-based uh, cloud education? Yes, we are doing that. We are doing that. But the idea, as you mentioned, the other universities that are going to come in, which is good, is going to put the pressure to everyone. If you don't improve, I have other options, which is very good. Otherwise, we are going to be comfortable and do what we want to do there. But yes, that is what we are doing at my universities. And as you, if you look to the news by the government, our employment rate is about 98.6% because we are branding those things for the future generation. Right. So, uh, Professor Abuldenia, in terms of uh, what you've been doing with the UAVELAS Entrepreneurial University, how do you see entrepreneurship coming in post-COVID and going into the next generation? Because I think entrepreneur, entrepreneurship and SMEs are going to be the backbone of the recovery pathway to the COVID-19 crisis as a pandemic as well as beyond. So in, in, very quickly from your thoughts, how do you see uh, the SMEs and entrepreneurship coming into uh, the education forums? It's one of the easiest things to get in uh, to the education, uh, 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 the, the transformation of education because currently uh, entrepreneurship is not built into the curricula of uh, I would really put entrepreneurship as one of the elements that should go into yeah. every curriculum. I ask the, the question from every lecturer, uh, what is the value of the knowledge that you are uh, delivering? Uh, where is the money? How do you create wealth from your knowledge? So when I ask that question, the answer comes and then you know, the, the approach is entrepreneurship. So how do you really bring that entrepreneurial experience into the curriculum. So now, when you're online learning, there are many ways of bringing that part into the, uh, into the curriculum. So basically, it's one of the easiest to get into the curriculum. Uh, but if you start teaching entrepreneurship as an independent silo-based subject, that will never get into the heads of students. So basically, you have to remember, it is part of the curriculum and it's a subject that is integrated with all the other subjects. Right, thank you very much, Prof. Um, my next question is to Drew. Now, most students, they do this concept of a business degree and they want to get into an organization from a profit-making perspective. Now, for public organizations, the perspective is not necessarily profit. It's the creation of public value or a public good. And how do you kind of communicate this and train students to not just think of a business from a business perspective, but also to incorporate some kind of curriculum in terms of going forward and its role in the next uh, next phase of business development going forward post COVID. Yeah, um, I, I, I think you're absolutely right. That's uh, the, the difference between well, not necessarily short term value creation, but certainly financial value creation and what governments are there to do, which is provide mm -hmm. um, value for their citizens in the in the very long term. You know, we're all, they're going to be here forever, as it were. Um, I think, interestingly, at the moment, the, there is a, uh, I think we can, we can make that 
relevant to people by putting it into the actual context that we're we're living in. So, for example, there are you know increasing number of populist leaderships um, heading up our states, and um, we're you know sort of uh, propagation of fake news is quite common. Um, dismissing expert opinion, we've seen a lot of in recent times. And you know what that uh, what that all of those trends tend to do is yeah. undermine public trust. Um, and we're all citizens, and we all need to um, have that public trust. So I think the way we need to sort of go forward is to demonstrate how undermining of public trust is is can be counterbalanced by um, sort of ensuring that our systems of public scrutiny are are robust. Um, you know, emphasising the need for good governance and transparency. And in particular, as we sort of go into sort of an era of um, globalisation, um, that globally accepted reporting standards like international public sector accounting standards, or, uh, you know, increasingly we will probably see uh, sustainability reporting and carbon reduction reporting and so forth. All of those need to be there for building up that public trust and ensuring that citizens can sort of have confidence in, in their government. And a, sure. another, another dynamic on it is uh, with that increasing national debt and the intergenerational uh, inequity, um, it's important to emphasize that these things are not necessarily about short-term financial returns, generating long-term value, forcing people into thinking differently in terms of their financial planning, budgeting and forecasting in different ways that are geared towards the achievement of that longer term yeah. sustainability, taking in gender based budgeting or sustainability reporting along the way. So the actual content of a curriculum that reflects societal needs is quite different probably to one which is the business and corporate. Excellent. Thank you. That's a, that's a very valid point. And hopefully uh, there will be a a balance in education when students come out of this in the future generations that you know it's it's not just about a business profits but also looking at it from a balanced perspective uh in a holistic manner so to speak now one thing we didn't touch on uh throughout this panel discussion is business ethics and the the need for ethical education to be embedded in everything we do so um i, I would like to uh, i i hope manil is still around if he is, I would like to ask him about what his idea of uh, ethics being incorporated into the professional development courses are. Uh, yeah, uh, Rakhbika, th thank you for... Yes, Manu. Thank you. Uh, yes, I think uh, in, in the, in, at least in the accounting side and the profession, I think ethics is one of the cornerstones of a profession. And uh, especially in accounting because where public trust is a uh, big element of uh, uh, delivering our professional uh, services, uh, they are by one of the things that the public probably will rely on is how the, the, the behavior of the professional, which, which is basically uh, the foundation of, uh, uh, of that would be ethics. Now, when it comes to ethics, it's not something that, uh, well, I personally don't think it is something that you learn off a book. It is something that you need to practice, and that is something in any every curricula that it has to be embodied in every single stage of the whole process, uh, whereby you basically mold the the future professional into into behaving and acting in the in the ethical manner in which the public expects you to behave and act. I, I hope you <laughs> touched on what what you wanted. Yes, I think that covers uh, what uh, basically I wanted to say is to, the integrated concept of learning, integrated thinking, integrated learning. So I think we've uh, run out of time, but before I close off this, one thing I want to say that, you know, the world that we are going into is never going to be the same. Uh, I, don't, I don't see COVID-19 as either good or bad. It is what it is. And therefore, we have to deal with what things are and move on as a society, as a, as a species, and make the best of it and take whatever is thrown at us, uh, not as a positive or negative, but look at it from uh, uh, an opportunity to learn and 
to become better human beings overall. And uh, as a last note, I'd like to recommend, if you do have the time to look at this interesting movie called The Ivory Tower, which was released in 2014 about academia and how, how it is moving, particularly in the US. So uh, leaving you with that, I hand it over back to Professor Watavala. Thank you so much. And thank you panel members for your extremely valuable insights. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you yeah. Okay. Uh, I think uh, uh, let me uh, thank all of you because uh, it was a very, very, I think, uh, thought provoking and also something that we need to look at uh, very, very seriously. Repositioning higher and professional education in the next uh, economy. We must thank our chairman and co-chairman. Then, of course, Professor Ho, uh, who gave a very, very, I think, uh, insightful and also a lot of uh, thought has gone into it and uh, digitization seems to be one of the major areas but of course with the others coming in and uh, the uh, moderation the moderator dr uh, professor lakmika did a excellent job and uh, we had a very uh, i think uh, eminent panel uh, who really uh, both from the university side uh, from the professional side uh, also maybe more uh, talking of the digit digitalization that was there. So let me thank uh, all of them. We had, uh, uh, of course, Dr. Uh, Professor Lakhminga Perera, then Professor Paul Mehta, uh, Manil Jasinger, uh, Drew Cullen, uh, Mariam Riza, Dr. Ali Katibi, uh, Ms. Lorita Ross, Dr. Chandra Emuldini. I know that uh, some of you, especially, I think we have about four from uh, Melbourne. Uh, time must be quite late, but thank you very much. Uh, uh, for uh, sparing your valuable time and uh, uh, being with us. Uh, it has really uh, uh, given the real uh, insights into what we should do into uh, education as uh, we as my, uh, the professional body and we look for your support because uh, we really need your support in order that our professionals, generally the professionals are uh, people who are with the practical knowledge so that they are a able to get jobs and we now see that uh, most of the undergraduates uh, while in the university are doing the professional courses in order uh, to enjoy a better better uh, job and also the, the sort of uh, uh, capability uh, and the recognition from the uh, mainly from the private sector but I think Drew was there. Drew we need to see how we can really create the value because public sector really has still not understood it and we need to do a lot of work uh, on that area where professionals can go in and change the whole stuff. Yeah. So, uh, let me thank you. I think it has been a long day for all our participants. Uh, four hours uh, is not a short time. Uh, also, uh, if it was maybe uh, in a hotel or a classroom, it would have been different. But uh, we are now on a different mode uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic. So I'm sure all of you are comfortable at home or in office. Uh, and that uh, you will have uh, a very, very good day's rest. And uh, tomorrow we are starting our sessions. Uh, also in the afternoon, uh, we had said 1.30. So if you're there at least by uh, 1.45, that would be very fine. But those who are on the panels and uh, the uh, uh, speaker slots, uh, I think uh, if they log in early, uh, they can check their systems and be ready. So once again, uh, let me uh, thank you for uh, this uh, first day is our convention on Business 2030, Global Impact and Value Creation in the Next Normal. I think uh, this is a process that we will have to go through. And I do hope that not only us, but also the government, the ministers and others, uh, what they said today, uh, will be able to take this forward and maybe change uh, for better times uh, for all of us. Thank you and uh, uh, good night and uh, good day for all of you. Thank you. Thank you.